Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We'll begin in a minute, but before we start with the agenda, I hope you've made yourself familiar with navigating the Zoom interpretation feature. But if you haven't, you'll see the Zoom interpretation icon on the lower right corner of your screen. You just need to click that icon and select the language that you prefer. Today's proceedings are available in English, Mongolian, and Bahasa Indonesia. So welcome to today's webinar on social protection for economic inclusion, adapting the graduation approach in Asia and the Pacific. I'm Lainey Thomas, Senior Social Development Specialist from the Asian Development Bank. I'd like to thank you for joining us. Today, we have three and a half hours of interactive sessions focusing on breaking the poverty trap and learning from graduation programs in the Philippines and across Asia. We have the honor today of the Vice President for Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development of the Asian Development Bank, Bambang Susantono, to deliver the opening remarks. VP, the floor is yours. Distinguished guests, ADP colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to all. It is my great pleasure to open today's event, Social Protection for Economic Inclusion. I'm glad to see that many participants of this webinar come from various stakeholders of the subject. As you all know, we have made considerable progress in development and poverty reductions over the past 50 years. Yet, even before the pandemic, the region was still home to about 173 million people living in extreme poverty and 864 million living on less than $3.20 per day. The COVID-19 pandemic significantly disrupted life across much of Asia and the Pacific. It set back economies in terms of poverty, inequality, and employment. It also exacerbated pre-existing vulnerabilities for some groups. In fact, our estimates show that the COVID-19 pandemic has pushed an additional 78 million people into extremely poverty, reversing developing Asia's poverty clock. Among those disproportionately affected by the pandemic are children, youth, women, older persons, and people with disabilities. The truth is that over 60% of our region's populations was not covered by adequate social protections even prior to the pandemic. And as the crisis has underscored, social protection is a vital tool to safeguard and protect those most vulnerable to poverty. It is clearer than ever that we must strengthen social protection systems and adopt innovative approaches that recognize the multidimensional nature of poverty. What we call the graduation approach is one such innovation. It is built on a foundation of social assistance and enables households to achieve socioeconomic resilience. Graduation programs deliver a carefully sequenced set of integrated solutions to poor households, combining social assistance with asset transfers, livelihood promotions, financial inclusions, and social empowerment, along with dedicated mentoring and coaching. When adapted to local context, this graduation approach pillar together contribute to long-term sustainable and resilient livelihoods with measurable improvements in people's lives. We believe graduation programs can offer governments a promising pathway to meet the needs of people who are currently living in poverty and it builds resilience against potential shocks. One example is ADB first pilot use of the graduation approach in the Philippines, which is contributing to an increasing amount of compelling global evidence. The pilot took place in the province of Tigros Occidental and was concluded in 2020. The Department of Labor and Employment led the implementations 
with support from our civil society partners, REC and Innovation for Property Actions. The pilot project targeted 1,800 poor households building on the government's existing cash transfer and livelihood programs. It tested several ways of delivering elements of the graduation approach to individual and to groups. The results were then compared with a group of households that only received the cash transfers. A preliminary analysis of the September 2020 mobile phone survey showed that the graduation approach improved household resilience against the COVID-19 shock in several ways, including financial health, food security, and mental health. We will present detailed results and insights from the pilot later today, so stay tuned. Given this potential to boost household resilience, even in the face of a major shock, the Philippines Department of Social Welfare and Development decided to scale up the graduation approach with continued ADB support. In addition, we are now supporting three new graduation programs. First, for resettled households in the Philippines under the Malolos Clark Railway projects. Second, in Tamil Nadu, India, as part of the inclusive, resilient, and sustainable housing for urban poor sector project. And third, in Mongolia, as part of the second shock responsive social protection project. ADB's social development thematic group have produced knowledge product, promoted evidence-based analysis, and expanded the ways the approach can be applied in ADB operations. Some examples of this, including multimedia products, are shown here in the slide. So, what can you expect today? We will share the results and robust evidence from the graduation pros pilot in the Philippines to draw lessons and insights which can be applied in other economic inclusion programs. We will also discuss with global technical experts on how to adopt and to adapt these programs and to scale up efforts. The sessions will then identify key points to consider when planning, implementing, or scaling up the graduation approach. In closing, I do hope that we will continue working together toward our common goal of addressing the remaining poverty and reducing inequality in Asia and the Pacific by learning and sharing from one another. Thank you all for joining us today, and we look forward to your active engagement. Thank you, Vice President Susantono. I'm now pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Abhijit Banerjee, the Ford Foundation International Professor of Economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, co-winner of the 2019 Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences and co-founder of the Abul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab. We're very excited to hear his views as a leading global expert on the graduation approach and poverty reduction interventions more broadly. To give more background and information on Professor Banerjee's distinguished career and to kickstart this important conversation, we have with us today, Dr. Dean Carlin, Distinguished Professor of Economics and Finance at Northwestern University and founder and president of Innovations for Poverty Action. Dean has been a longtime friend and supporter of ADB and the graduation pilot in the Philippines, providing vital support and leadership to generate. This, professor Banerjee yeah. is a professor of economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. After completing his undergraduate I was just about ready to hand over to Dean to introduce our keynote speaker. Dean, over to you. Hi, it's a great pleasure to be here with everybody today. And also with great pleasure, I would like to introduce Abhijit Banerjee as our keynote speaker for this gathering. Professor Banerjee is a professor of economics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. After completing his undergraduate and master's at the University of Calcutta 
at Jawaharlal University in India. He then completed his doctoral work at Harvard University. He is one of the co-founders of the Jamil Poverty Action Lab. And two years ago, he co-won the Nobel Prize in Economics in what was a unique award. In economics, most Nobel Prizes are awarded for critical theoretical contributions to our understanding of economics and social science. Professor Banerjee's award, however, was for a movement, a movement which recognized we we're failing at answering critical questions about the causes and consequences of poverty and what to do about it. Failing at such questions is not merely an academic problem, but a critical humanitarian and ethical one. Banerjee, with his co-winners, led a movement to bring methods from other disciplines to the forefront of economics, making randomized control trials a critical component of our approach in economics to tackling both fundamental questions in social science, but also immediately practical questions of policy. And that is also why Professor Banerjee's keynote for us could not be more fitting, as he will help us learn more from his experience, both about the nature of poverty, but also some practical and scalable questions for what to do. So with that, I will now turn the video over to Professor Banerjee with a broad opening question. What are some of the highlights from the international evidence on poverty traps? And specifically, what is the evidence on the graduation program and whether and why it helps to build sustainable sources of income for ultra poor households? Thank you very much for organizing this conference. Uh, this is an extremely apposite moment for it. This whole world is now reconsidering its social support policies in the context of the pandemic. And it's, it's great to be in a place where we can uh, so, sort of have an intellectual discussion of what, what's known so far and how we can help countries redesign their welfare policies to work better. And uh, thank you to the ADB for inviting me to give this talk. And thank you for Dean for uh, for organizing all of this and and moderating it. Um, the I think the good news, the very uh, actually surprising good news, is that uh, the to the extent that anything in economics has clear answers, there is there is actually relatively clear answers here. I, I'm I'm actually impressed by how my, how much consistency there is in the evidence. Uh, there's the, the core question that I think a lot of this uh, ag research agenda and the, and the policy questions around it are dancing around is this uh, question of how, how, much, of, how much of the uh, state of being poor comes from just having been born poor. Uh, as against, for example, you know, lacking the skills or lacking the motivation to get out of poverty. And I think on that, I think the evidence is very clear. There are, at least among the very poor, there are lots of people who are poor because they are poor, who, who have the capacity to be very different, to be much less poor, but who, who don't manage because uh, they are just unfortunate they, they don't get a chance and and the evidence from that uh, comes a lot from the graduation programs the uh, the fact that you know if you look at you know the the uh, track the the beneficiaries the treatment people as in the control people for for example, for 10 years, as we have in West Bengal in India, you see that the differences are persistent. And the, the persistent difference is the hallmark of, of a poverty trap, which is that a one-time benefit can have long-term effects. The reason is that if it's sort of the un, unwinding of the, the vicious cycle of poverty, when if you're poor because you're poor, then you stay non-poor because you're non-poor. And that, that seems to be very much the pattern we observe. We, we've been looking at this quite carefully, as I said, in West Bengal. And there it's very clear that, for example, you know, 10 years later, the people who got the, uh, the, the um, graduation program are around 25% richer, both measured by consumption and income. Uh, this is 
than the control group. Both groups have got richer, so it's not because the control group is stuck, but the difference remains. This difference actually was smaller in the first three years and actually grew between the year three and year seven, and then has stayed at the higher level since. And I'm optimistic that it's going to, you know, barring uh, disasters like the one we just are going through, um, this will persist. This, there's similar and similarly encouraging evidence, for example, from, from Bangladesh. There's a, there, again, there's at the seven year follow up, you see um, something of the same order of magnitude of difference between the, between the treatment group and the control group. Um, there's some difference in the way they interpret the evidence, but I, I, th I think that prima facie, it looks very similar. Uh, maybe not surprisingly, Bangladesh is right next to West Bengal. Um, and from other countries, in other countries, the effects are maybe not as dramatically positive. And, I mean, the, the, the Indian and Bangladeshi results were, to start with, the best. And, and maybe that reflects, for example, the fact that the selection was different. The, you know, the, maybe these programs were most effective in identifying the poorest of the poor. But it, it, in all of these countries, we see evidence of a durable effect. So that's, that's sort of the, you know, I think the, the very good news. And, and this kind of very good news, uh, I mean, this one country, um, Honduras, where we don't find effects, and then we don't find durable effects. But I think that the general point is, is, is still very clear, that there is, a, there is actually a surprising amount of evidence that the program works across from Latin America to Africa to Asia. Um, that then um, compelled us, of course, to think about, you know, what, what could be going on? What, what's, what, what are the mechanics of this? And one of the things that uh, what, uh, what I think we've learned from the India study, the West Bengal study, is that there's no particular, um, that, the, that it's not the case that there's just one mechanism, one thing that has to go right. But in fact, what happens is interestingly uh, sort of diverse in the sense that, you know, in the first round, in the, in the period, um, between, you know, the, you getting the program and let's say year three, the big, big difference comes from just getting the assets, the mostly livestock, earnings from livestock. But by year three, you start to see incomes from, uh, you know, a small business that you create, which is non, you know, non-livestock business. And that then becomes a, a very big part of your earnings by year seven, of your extra earnings by year seven. But by between year seven and year 10, we see that that sort of uh, tamps down and what takes its place is migration earnings. The, the children of these uh, beneficiaries are now, you know, in the late teens or early 20s, and they are actually traveling further than the con equivalent children in the control, and they're making money. So it's, in other words, it's not that people are, these people are not, they got one thing and they stick to it, they just become better at taking advantage of whatever opportunities are offered. Um, it doesn't mean that you always will do migration at year 10 in Bangladesh. We see that you know, maybe the, the long-term effects come from you know, expanding your business. But the main point is that it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a flexible push. So you, you are able, once you get the push, you're able to maneuver yourself to take advantage of whatever other opportunities are going. The other, I think, sort of maybe even more long-term question for or more, maybe more basic question is, you know, what's, what's driving this? Uh, why, why, why do we have these effects? What, what is it that enables people? And there, of course, there are multiple answers. There's clearly, you know, having money enables you to buy assets and assets are important. So, I mean, I, mean, I, I don't, I wouldn't, uh, I, I certainly don't want to dismiss that. Uh, it's also important that, um, for example, there might be a certain amount of security, a willingness to take some risks, to make an investment on something uncertain, like looking for a job in a distant place. All of that, I think, is happening. But interestingly, I think this is some work that 
you know, Dean and I and Chris, Chris Udry and Hannah Trackman did together in Ghana, where we see that not only, I mean, Ghana, again, there, there are durable effects of the program. And in particular, what we, we do quite carefully there is try to make sure that we uh, sep try to separate the effects of getting an asset, the asset itself having, you know, making you more productive and something else. And what we find is that even if you, even within the set of people who get the asset, we, we vary the amount of, uh, of uh, additional support they get. So people have a bit more cash in hand and they seem to have, the effects seem to be quite, quite uh, that by itself seems to have an effect, meaning that even if you don't get any extra assets and you don't need any extra capital for what you're doing, we, we provide them with an activity to do bag making and they make more bags and uh, those bags are more are better quality. And that seems to be not because they have any more capital because the capital is we provide the capital, but because they seem to be just more enthusiastic about everything they do. They're, they are more productive because they seem to be uh, just less, maybe just less depressed about their life. So I, I, I do think that that's very important, that there is a, that there is a, 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 psycho, a psychological eff effect. Um, and I think that that brings us, I think, to a sort of a, is, I think, an understanding that I think the fact that we have long-term poverty, that these people are, you know, left where they are and sort of really in some ways, uh, you know, they, really, they don't get an opportunity, is also profoundly depressing and dehumanizing. And I think that that general sense that there are lots of people who could be not rich, but at least normally poor rather than extraordinarily poor and who who are just waiting for someone to treat them like a normal human being to give them a chance that they never got because they were just born into misfortune uh, i think that that's a that's a profoundly transformative insight and i think one that uh, will i hope make the policy we make in the coming years better and different thank you Thank you. So following up on that, what, where do you think the biggest gaps are? Where is the evidence gap? What, what, can, what can we as researchers be tackling? What do practitioners and policymakers, what are the questions that they're asking that you think are, are, are addressable and that we can dedicate the next several years to learning more so that this, this fight against poverty can improve and improve and improve? So you ask, um, where are the evidence gaps. What, what do we know, need to know now? I mean, now we know, know much more than we knew 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Uh, what's the way forward? So I, I think that the encouraging piece, as I said, is that we, we have seen stable, solid evidence of success where maybe we know less. Uh, what, are, what are things? One is, I think, just the role of, you know, the, the, uh, the programs, the graduate profession programs invest a lot in the handholding part of it, of, of uh, psychosocial support, if you like, uh, making sure that the beneficiaries are sort of encouraged, told that they can do it, uh, helped if needed. Um, and I think on that, um, I think the evidence so do we need that? That's expensive, actually. It's only about half of the cost of the program is just the assets and the rest is actually all of that. So that's expensive and uh, we, we do need to know whether that's needed. Um, there's some work we've done on it and others have done on it. Um, I think that, uh, and it's sort of, I would say that's where more clarity would be helpful because it, it's big, big money, uh, I think. Uh, on the one side, I, I think that the, in Ghana, again, with Dean and Chris and Hannah, we, we studied uh, exactly this question. And some people were given the full graduation program. Others were just given an asset, a goat, basically, a set of goats. And you see that that has no long-term effect. So that's one strike against the view that you can get rid of the encouragement. On the other hand, uh, and with that, there's also, I think, 
I, I mean, and Dean may tell us more about this, but I think this recent work of Dean's and others uh, showing that maybe just the psychosocial component is valuable in itself, maybe from West Africa. Um, I just saw some new results from that, suggesting that though the psychosocial component already has effects on people's people's earnings and has uh, so maybe just encouraging people itself is valuable. On the other hand, uh, we did some work in Kenya um, where we were working on the question of uh, universal basic income and to benchmark universal basic income, we also gave uh, certain villages, we just gave people uh, a lump sum amount, um, much smaller than the value of the universal basic income, but still a bigger amount than they would get in a month. And after two years, we see that those people seem to be doing fine too. They, they are really are performing just as well as the people who are in the U universal basic income program. So um, even though their lifetime wealth has gone up by a lot less, they seem to be buying assets, uh, running more businesses, etc. So I, I think the evidence there is mixed and needs to be sorted out. I think it's uh, it may well be that it depends on who. Uh, I think the universal basic income program applies only to the relative, uh, you know, to everyone in the village. So that uh, whereas the graduation program uh, applies to the poorest of the poor, the people who have been treated, maltreated by life in many different ways. And so I, I do think that these may not be inconsistent answers. It may well be that for many people it's enough to just give them an, uh, an asset, but for others it might well be that we need to do more. Um, the other question that seems to me to be important is what, how does this compare to, for example, a flow program like universal basic income? Is it, you know you get oh, a certain amount every month. Now that has its downsides, which is that you know you have to save that up somehow. Found a way to save it up, and saving is difficult uh, at the best of times to get get into to buy something like a, you know a machine or a plot of land. You just can't buy it on your monthly take. That's one side of it, you, you might take a loan, but people are discouraged. People don't like taking loans. Many people, you know, microcredit uh, loans have been offered to many of these people. They don't want it. So there's there's a whole bunch of uh, reasons why that might be less valuable than a lump sum. On the other side, uh, the pandemic tells us that you know after you do everything and you do everything right and your business is up and running, the pandemic can come and clean you out. Your business is uh, you know, it sort of he gets hit by something as big as a pandemic. You're in trouble. So I, I and now if you had universal basic income, the income would keep coming back, and you would be you could restart. So I, I think that we need to think about the combinations of these things. I think it are, so. Is it useful to give people a lump sum? Maybe, but does it need to be? combined with some insurance program where if you get hit by something like the pandemic, then there is some rescue package. Uh, these are questions that will need to be, especially when we go to scale, and this will surely happen to some people, some people just will happen that the income owner dies. And then what do you do? I mean, uh, what's the, you know, leaving maybe the rest of the family bereft and without an income owner? What do you do at that point? So I, I do think that we need to think of the design of the graduation program in combination with other social insurance programs. So that those two seem to me to be uh, critical critical questions um, where, you know, you, I my mean, third one is sort of implicit in what I just said, which is that, you know, how much money, I mean, is, is, a, you know, is the amount, so we do see, as I said, I said, we see similar effects from the lump sum and the UBI after two years. Now the pandemic happened, so maybe their the equivalence will eventually break down. But is, is it the case that in some other place we'll find that, you know, a certain lump sum is, uh, which is in present value, a lot less than the uh, amount of the U UBI al already serves that purpose. So that, that would be a third related question that we would like to know the answers to. Well, thank you again for asking that question. Hi. Thank you very much to Dean and Abjit for sharing your thoughts. 
your inspirational words on the graduation approach and for kicking off today's events. I'd like to remind everybody that a recording of the event will be available through socialprotection.org after the event. Now, moving on, I'd like to introduce Wendy Walker, ADB's Chief of Social Development Thematic Group for our first panel discussion entitled Road to Resilience, the Graduation Approach in Asia and the Pacific. Wendy, over to you. Thanks very much, Lenny, and thanks very much, Professor Banerjee and Dean, for that excellent opening to the range of issues which this event will be investigating. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good afternoon and good evening, all participants, and welcome to the kickoff session of this program titled Road to Resilience, the Graduation Approach in Asia and Pacific. We have an excellent set of panel speakers today, but also not very much time to hear their views on the graduation approach, the evidence of its effectiveness in building resilience and options for expansion and scale up in the region. So let me start right away with some very quick introductions, and you can learn more about them from their full bios, which will be on the screen. The first person is Yasuyuki Sawada. He's the Chief Economist and Director General of the Economic Research and Regional Cooperation De uh, Department here at the Asian Development Bank. Uh, you've just met Dean Carlin, President and Founder of Innovations for Poverty Action and dis Distinguished Professor of the Economics and Finance at uh, Northwestern University. Ashamaran Abed is the Senior Director, Microfinance and Ultra Poor Graduation at BRAC. Karen Shelsig is the Principal Social Sector Specialist at the East Asia Department, also here at the Asian Development Bank. So I'm going to make a very quick introduction to the session and then follow up with questions to some of the to 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 all of the panelists. As we just learned, targeted social assistance, which is usually delivered as cash transfers, ensures that poor households are able to meet their basic needs, access essential services such as health and education, and avoid further slipping into poverty. When combined with social assistance, the graduation approach and similar economic inclusion or productive inclusion programs aim to help people invest in sustainable pathways out of poverty through a combination of, protective, of productive assets, coaching and mentorship, training and links to community resources. This propels them ahead and provides a foundation from which they are better able to withstand future shocks. The health shocks from the current COVID pandemic combined with the economic impacts wrought by the global lockdown measures, have had an immediate and severe impact on the state of extreme poverty globally and in the Asia and Pacific region. The scale of the crisis means growing numbers of, of people are experiencing vulnerability and financial insecurity and risk falling, into, falling further into extreme poverty. The objective of this session is to learn from our panelists how scaling up graduation programs could offer a promising pathway for meeting the needs of the extreme poor and building their resilience to the current and future crises and shocks. So with that basic framing, um, let me begin by starting the round of questions and I'll reach out first to my colleague, Karen. Uh, Karen, are you there? Yeah. Yeah. Many, thank you. Uh, many governments have invested heavily in large scale national cash transfer programs for the poor. What are some of the shortcomings of these cash based social assistance programs in terms of building resilience to shocks? Thanks, Wendy, uh, and good morning, everybody. Uh, let me just say it's so nice to see so many of my old friends and colleagues, both as panelists and as attendees. Um, you know, I want to start by clarifying that. I think cash transfers are an absolutely essential part of the social assistance toolbox, uh, especially when it comes to responding to shocks and crises. These could be national in scope or at the household level. Cash transfers make sure that people can still meet their basic needs and access essential services. Uh, so again, I, uh, I think they're essential, but at the same time, Poverty and deprivation, we know, are about so much more than just a lack of income. Poverty is multidimensional. 
And cash just addresses the one aspect. Uh, it's an important one uh, and a fundamental one to be sure, but there are definitely other facets to consider uh, for resilience that's needed for lasting poverty reduction. You know, also, and contrary to popular belief, most cash transfers offer actually only a very basic amount, generally worth quite little when compared to poverty lines. A lot of the big national government cash transfer programs in our region are conditional. Uh, they're targeted to kids in a household and they're meant to cover the direct costs of going to school or going to health centers. And the idea, of course, is that those healthier and better educated kids will ultimately grow up to get better jobs, be more resilient later in life. But if a shock happens today or tomorrow, that minimal cash transfer that the family gets isn't really going to go very far. Um, having said that, though, uh, a lot of the countries in our region and in the world, uh, indeed, used those cash transfer programs in COVID times to very quickly top up the basic amounts that people received. So that was a very good thing, thing in terms of being shock responsive. But to the question of building resilience, as in making poor people better able to cope with or bounce back from an economic hit, uh, maybe it's come from a drought or a terrible winter or a major recession, COVID. You know, here we've seen uh, that this multi-dimensional approach pays off. Uh, it gives people a much bigger upfront combined package of complementary support, includes not just cash, uh, but also making sure that working age adults in the households have the assets, the skills and the capabilities to pursue more diversified sources of income. So the graduation approach, of course, aims to do all of those things and includes the productive asset, the technical training, but it goes beyond it with this coaching and mentoring element, which I would say is absolutely essential. You know, the trained coaches are social workers often who look after participants and visit them to provide this tailored and individualized support. You know, we, we just heard Professor Banerjee mention that this encouragement element alone can have a psychological impact that results in higher productivity levels, can be actually profoundly transformative. Um, I'd say we often don't recognize the toxic stress that people experience when they're living a sort of hand-to-mouth existence. And there is this growing body of evidence on poverty and mental health with poverty linked to depression and anxiety and vice versa. Deteriorating mental health can be linked to poor economic outcomes. So while providing cash is definitely good uh, and necessary, especially when it comes to immediate needs, I think cash plus assets plus coaching is much better at making households more resilient. Uh, and since we'll talk about all of this a lot more, I'll uh, leave it there and turn back to you, Wendy. Thanks. Okay, great, Karen. Thank you very much. And now, Dean, shifting to a question on the evidence of programs to date, um, what is the evidence on the impacts of integrated approaches that use cash assistance and livelihood support with the addition of mentoring, mentorship and, and coaching. So building off of the discussion that you just had with uh, Professor Banerjee, can you tell us a little bit more about the evidence on impact? Thank you. Sure, hi everybody again. Um, in some sense, it, this is a bit of an oversimplification, but a lot of it comes down to short run versus long run. The, there's all sorts of reasons to use cash as a tool, it can be it done at scale, it can be done quickly, as we've seen some really impressive programs done in this tragic time and with COVID and the way um, cash transfers have been able to be rolled out um, really quickly. Um, and it, it helps with immediate needs. Um, but long term impacts are often less so. Now, there are some, I want to be clear, there are some really impressive long term results that you can get from cash transfer programs. I'm not saying not nil. Um, but it's clear it's not the um, not the the rising tide that lifts up all boats, and there's a lot of other issues. Poverty is a complicated beast, and it has many root causes. And it's not all as simple as you need money to make money and transfer cash, and you can solve the problems. And that's really the underlying theory behind the graduation program. Now, the question, of course, is how do you go from that kind of very simply stated idea that poverty is complicated and you need to hit myriad, you know, multifaceted approach to knowing what those um, add-ons are and how to implement them at scale. Um, now, the exciting thing, and as you, it's already been referred to, some of what Professor Banerjee mentioned, as well as other people we mentioned in here, 
is a lot of these programs are actually operating at scale. And so it's quite exciting to see that it is, that it is uh, quite viable to do at scale. Now, you know, naturally, like the, the dream of both a policymaker and a researcher is, is to say, well, can we figure out who needs what? Right. And that, in some sense, is like the million dollar question. And for instance, if we knew that a household could be more resilient and survive and prosper in the long run with simply a lump sum cash transfer, by all means, then just do that and don't do these other things. Or if the flip, if we knew that um, a program that helped deal with some of the psychological and family challenges that they were facing through, for instance, a cognitive behavioral therapy program or something of that sort with coaching could actually lead to long run positive impacts without the cash transfer, frankly, we probably would want to do that. Now, the challenge is how can we figure out how to blend those so that we're not just saying, well, some people need one, some people need the other, so let's do both for everybody. And I think that's one of the bigger challenges we face because we have seen each of these individually have positive impacts. We have seen, for instance, we have a study that, um, that Professor Banerjee referred to from Sahel um, in West Africa, where we have seen the graduation program done with a very robust socio-psychological component to really build, build capabilities of the household for dealing with problems and no cash transfer that was beyond their normal cash transfer no lump sum is what i mean there was it was built on top of a, a more of a humanitarian um you know weekly monthly cash transfer but there was no large lump sum and yet the program still worked yeah. without the 200 300 dollars 400 dollars transfer now it didn't work as well to be clear but if you think about it as just cost effectiveness it was actually um it actually beat in that sense the, the program with the cash, the transfer, the large cash transfer. So that doesn't mean that's the answer by any means, but it tells us that these are both important paths and the real uh, hopefully hopeful insight that we can try to come up with it through iteration and further testing is learning how to mix these up and how to figure out what to do where. And that's in some sense, I think the, where the, the biggest challenge we face and how to, integrate that in with program operations. Um, it's one of the reasons why, frankly, I'm particularly excited about technology as an approach, because it allows through technology, I think there's a better path towards customization, where one could try to figure out at a community or a household level, what is the, what is the right message? What is the right coaching that needs to be done? So I'll stop. Okay, thank you. I hope maybe we'll have time at the end to come back and 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 find out a little bit more about what kinds of technology specifically you're 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 referring to there that have been uh, most most efficacious. But let me now turn to uh, Shamaran, and I'd like to ask you um, to tell us a little bit more about the experience of BRAC and what you have learned during the current crisis, the current COVID crisis, in the programs that you've been operating or or investigating. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks very much, Wendy. Um, and first of all, uh, it's great to be able to speak on this panel. So that's uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, uh, yeah. So if I look at you know the experience of BRAC, and let me just begin by saying that when BRAC uh, designed this program almost twenty years ago now, one of the main objectives was to build resilience. Right. So we were looking at previous programs in the you know before we had graduation and. You know, obviously, BRAC and many other organizations did, you know, many different types of programs with people in, in extreme poverty and even ultra poverty. But what we were finding was that, you know, uh, you know, putting, I mean, we weren't being able to put ultra poor households on a sustainable path out of ultra poverty, right? So that was one of the main objectives. And then if you, if you look at sort of the program design in the initial days and every sort of iteration since or every version of it since what we've tried to do is build more resilience into the program in multiple ways. And that's basically been uh, sort of borne out in a lot of the research that has, that has been done and that we, we've, we've seen the results of. So even the seven year study that Professor Banerjee talked about earlier, which was on, on the BRAC program, uh, we've seen that you know, ultra poor households, which has gone through a graduation program are much better equipped to go 
to, uh, to be able to get through shocks. Uh, and obviously in a country like Bangladesh, where we have the, the largest um, um, implementation of graduation programs, I mean, you know, being able to, you know, uh, deal with shocks and, and come out and, and, and come out at the other end uh, without having your all, all your livelihoods and all the gains wiped out is a major part of this program because we see very regular shocks, whether it's floods or cyclones or, or other kinds of shocks. So generally, you know, we have we have a sense that you know the graduation program does build resilience and and does prepare you to 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 withstand shocks up to a certain extent, obviously. Now, if I come to you know what we've been seeing over the last one year with the with the pandemic, um, obviously let me just start by saying that you know in, in the in the early days, early weeks, days and weeks of the pandemic when, you know, Bangladesh and other countries where we work were in lockdown, obviously everybody was impacted more or less. And there's no doubt that ultra poor households were particularly badly affected. But there are a few things we saw through that period practically from our work. Um, so maybe I'll mention a few elements of the program that we saw worked well uh, in, that, in that situation. So one of the things that we try to do is uh, is asset or income diversification as part of the program, right? So when we're giving assets, when we're building livelihoods, it's not just one source of income. We try to build multiple sources of income, right? So when we've looked at you know uh, households in ultra poverty who are going through a graduation program, um, we were tracking. So let me just set this up a little more. So typically, you know, we have an annual cohort that comes in at the beginning of every year. So you know, when the pandemic hit in March of 2020. We had one cohort that started early 2019 that was in the second year, would have graduated end of 2020. And then we had a new cohort that was just coming in in 2020, which had just started. Um, now with the new cohort, not, you know, we hadn't started the implementation. So it was too early for them to see any results of the graduation program, but we were really looking at, you know, how was the 2019 cohort faring having gone through about 15 months of the program, right? And also we, we, were, we were tracking recent graduates of previous cohorts, the 2017 cohort, the 2018 cohort. And what we were seeing is, you know, that those who were able to diversify their assets, so they had different sources of income, some from agriculture sources, some from non-farm sources, they were obviously, you know, able to better withstand because even if they, their incomes were uh, going down or even disappearing from some sources, they were more likely to have some income from other sources. So, you know, that was one uh, element that we saw quite clearly. Secondly, one of the you know one of the main vulnerabilities that we see with ultra poor households is social marginalization, right? So these households tend to be completely cut off from the communities even where they are. So you know other people within those communities, uh, you know, don't don't you know don't almost see these people. I mean they're invisible even within their own community. So when you when you find them and you target them and bring them into the program, one of the main things we do is socially reintegrate them into the communities and into, into that particular, uh, into the village and in the wider, wider society. And what that does is it allows them to then access, be much better able to access local support and also local government support. So what we saw was even during the worst days of the lockdown, when, when things were really bad, uh, those households that had come into a graduation program and were now able to access that, those, you know, uh, uh, you know, were part of that community, were much better able to go and, and get support from, you know, local elites, uh, people who are better off within those villages. They were able, because they were now connected to them, uh, they were able to go and get support, get some food when, you know, in, 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 the, in the worst days of the pandemic. They were also much more likely to be able to access government stimulus, right? Because as part of the program, we also link them to government social protection programs. So they were much more likely to have those links and have their names in those lists uh, that the government used to provide cash stimulus packages. And so our program participants, almost all of them were able to access government stimulus packages. So that was a big plus as well. Uh, and the third thing I would mention is, is uh, access to financial services. So you know, even, though, even, the, uh, even the participants in the, in the second year of the program, and of course the participants who had recently graduated had savings, um, and that was a you know a big uh, thing for them. So they had some savings with BRAC or you know in in other places with uh, whoever they were 
whichever program they were a part of. And they were able to access those savings and use that um, when, when the incomes dried up in those, in those early days of lockdown and before the government stimulus packages kicked in. Um, also coming out of the lockdown, you know, they were able to access uh, loans if they were part of the microfinance programs or get refinancing of existing loans uh, if they already were borrowing from microfinance programs. So that also builds resil I mean, you know, builds resilience and is, it allows you to better come out of a situation like that. So the multiple ways where we saw that, you know, ultra poor households were able to fare better than ultra poor households in graduation programs were able to fare better than those that were not. Having said that again, I think, let me just end by saying it also exposed uh, the need for a stronger social social protection system that works for the poorest people, right? And particularly, the challenges we saw were mainly in urban areas. So, you know, in with with ultra poverty in rural areas, we were able to get out there and provide support and put them on lists and and get help to them. But, you know, uh, the incomes in urban areas dried up so quickly um, once the lockdowns happened, and we were so unprepared to be able to meet the needs of those people, and because they were they are typically, you know, social protection programs are almost non-existent uh, in in urban slums. Uh, that was where we saw a big uh, a big challenge, um, and obviously we have to figure out ways to get you know urban ultra poor households into um, you know graduation type programs that build resilience, and that that we found was a was a big challenge. But yeah, uh, I would just say a uh, lot of uh, good practical experience of how ultra poor households and graduation programs were able to fare better than those who are not. I'll stop here for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Very fascinating uh, overview of this last last year and the impacts. And uh, maybe come back and ask you about uh, what kinds of things you're going to be investigating, looking at uh, going, going forward for the longer term. Um, let me now turn to um, Sawadasan for his views on recovery. Um, so uh, Sawadasan, what are some of the viable pathways and recovery strategies that governments have or can use to build resilience for poor households in Asia and the Pacific, particularly during a, a protracted crisis like the, like the pandemic, which is really hitting everybody across the board? Uh, thanks a lot, Wendy, and thank you very much um, uh, for organizers uh, uh, for having me at this uh, really exciting uh, uh, panel. Uh, let me use, um, uh, in order to respond to um, Wendy's uh, uh, question, very critical question, how government can build up uh, resilience against the pandemic. Uh, let me share a few slides. Um, and um, uh, I, I wanna uh, discuss uh, from a, um, a kind of a bird's eye view um, uh, um, to think about this uh, role of a graduation program and broader social protection program. So second uh, slide uh, uh, shows the uh, very, very uh, bird's eye view. Um, uh, actually, uh, we published a book, uh, uh, this book titled Asia Journey to Prosperity. Um, uh, this is kind of a recapping uh, the points made by a VP Santono uh, at the beginning. Um, uh, this figure uh, shows the um, uh, reduction uh, speed of uh, poverty on, on y axis and uh, horizontal axis x axis is uh, economic growth. So Asia's uh, really phenomenal economic growth uh, in the last uh, three, four decades, uh, we observe a very strong uh, correlation uh, between poverty re reduction in y axis and um, uh, economic growth in x axis. And um, so next slide, um, uh, TUP, Targeting Ultra Poor Program. Um, uh, uh, there, there are many mechanisms behind uh, extremely successful poverty reduction stories uh, behind uh, Asia. Uh, but I think uh, TUP, Targeting Ultra Poor Program, and the graduation model uh, have been uh, regarded as a very, very effective innovation, um, uh, basically identified and scaled up by uh, BRAC. Uh, uh, so I really appreciate um, uh, BRAC's uh, uh, innovation on this respect. Um, actually, I, I got to this slide from uh, uh, BRAC and uh, uh, 10 years ago, I spent uh, two years at the BRAC uh, uh, headquarters in Mohakari, uh, uh, spending uh, uh, my sabbatical leave. And I spent uh, BRAC RET, uh, BRAC's uh, research and evaluation department for two years, uh, two years around uh, 10 years ago, and I got this. Uh, so maybe this is uh, a uh, prototype and um, uh, as the Dean uh, said, and also uh, Mr. Abed said, now we have uh, um, uh, multiple trajectories. But anyway, uh, I, I thought this is a really uh, impressive uh, uh, Brack uh, postulated 
um, uh, first uh, TUP program, studying from TUP program after graduation, a beneficiary can proceed to a general uh, a typical micro loan program, and then micro enterprise loan program, and finally reaching up to a SME loan program. So I thought that this is a really um, uh, nice uh, framework, and uh, I think this is a, uh, one of the many uh, innovations developed by uh, Brack. And the next slide, uh, actually, this is a recapping uh, what uh, Professor Benerji um, uh, shared with us and also uh, points made by uh, Dean. Uh, according to the celebrated RCT-based study on TUP, um, actually, this uh, study covers uh, six countries, Ethiopia, Ghana, Honduras, Pakistan, in Peru, uh, in addition to the uh, original uh, Bangladeshi uh, BRAC uh, uh, TUP program. Um, uh, but so this is an uh, article, a summary of an article uh, published by uh, Publishing Science by Professor Benerji, Professor Dufro, and Dean, and uh, others um, uh, top uh, uh, scholars. There are quite uh, impressive, robust, and almost universal impacts in all important social outcomes. Uh, you can see here, food security, asset ownership, finance, time use, you know, time poverty reduction, income enhancement, and more imp importantly, uh, mental health. So this, having this, um, um, uh, you know, uh, very important um, uh, graduation approach. Uh, so next slide, uh, uh, I'd like to switch a gear to talk about COVID-19. As uh, again, uh, BP Santono uh, mentioned, our research indicates without COVID-19 pandemic, a number of poor in developing Asia uh, would have continued to decline. However, the global health crisis, and we are confronting uh, this crisis now, are threatening to reversal of this uh, continuous uh, poverty reduction trend. And um, uh, depending on a uh, poverty line, but uh, our uh, estimate shows the uh, 78 million uh, people or 162 million people um, uh, falling below poverty line uh, due to COVID-19. And the uh, next slide, uh, I'd like to also point out, in order to counteract uh, negative COVID impact, governments are responding with a massive policy packages. Uh, since um, um, mid-April, uh, our research department, ADB, um, uh, started making this uh, ADB COVID-19 policy database, uh, which tracks large-scale policy packages of uh, uh, ADB's uh, developing member countries and economies. Uh, authorities Asia have announced uh, in total, um, uh, according to the latest update of this uh, uh, database, uh, 3.7 trillion US dollars, uh, over 15 percent of uh, uh, GDP. That scale of massive uh, uh, policy package already announced and that started implementing. Um, and um, um, uh, we track, uh, uh, you know, inside and uh, according to our database, uh, more than half of the, uh, 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 these um, massive packages uh, has been devoted uh, to uh, uh, government uh, health support, income support, as well as a revenue uh, support for families, household, and uh, uh, businesses. So next slide, I, I'd like to also um, uh, touch upon uh, related to COVID-19 response. Um, it's very worrisome. Uh, there seems to be a, a, a looming deterioration in mental health due to COVID-19. Uh, as Professor Benerji mentioned, Dean also mentioned, and also Karen mentioned, um, uh, I think a graduate program uh, can be uh, very effective, potentially very effective on the mental health domain through uh, uh, psychosocial interventions. I think that this is a very important point um, uh, in tackling a so-called psychological uh, poverty trap. But uh, I think the challenge is how to monitor different welfare measures, including the psychosocial situation, timely manner, and also possibly real time, uh, uh, so that the government can implement suitable interventions and uh, programs swiftly and effectively. And I have uh, two more slides. Uh, um, actually, I, I firmly believe innovative data or simply big data help better and timely uh, policy uh, 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 design and implementation to enhance uh, resilience. Uh, one example, this is a slightly deviated from a graduation program, but one example uh, of ADB. Um, uh, shortly after the outbreak of COVID-19, ADB supported uh, Philippine government's food transfer program uh, um, called the Bayan Bayanihan program with a 5 million US dollars uh, technical assistance um, uh, uh, package. 
Uh, Bayan Bahihang is a food transfer program for poor fam Filipino families targeting in uh, Metro Manila uh, who are suffering from the pandemic and the uh, resulting lockdown. Um, in order to identify uh, targeted communities, our uh, ADP research department provided a very granular uh, poverty map, uh, four kilometer by four kilometer grid, a very granular uh, detailed poverty map uh, made by an uh, innovative data set, uh, especially um, uh, daytime and uh, nighttime uh, satellite imageries. Uh, two pictures in the middle, you, you see um, a program implementation, uh, President Masa Asakawa of ADB is distributing uh, food packages in one of the communities. And um, uh, actually October last, uh, last year, I took a leave of absence from ADB and visited the poor community called the Payatas, uh, Barangay Payatas of Quezon City in order to help a Japanese NGO, uh, sort of Payatas. Um, uh, this area, Payatas, it used to be a dump site and garbage pickers are still residing in the community. So one of the poorest, a very, very much poorest community in Manila. Um, uh, unexpectedly, an NGO staff uh, member showed me pictures. They are receiving the food. They received uh, food back from ADB in May. So I could verify uh, effective uh, and very timely use of innovative data and granular poverty map uh, can make uh, actual uh, 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 very right uh, decision making. So, so next slide, uh, let me uh, uh, summarize the three areas to building up uh, resilience. Um, I think um, uh, first the graduation program and uh, other programs must made, uh, uh, made up sustainable for individuals in order to climbing up the ladder of the graduation. Uh, for example, it's imperative uh, to uh, create um, uh, quality jobs and the businesses as well as uh, uh, face access to different credit and financial services to support individuals and uh, small businesses. So number one is a uh, graduation program uh, can be a uh, next step into a broader uh, program uh, so that uh, uh, different type of uh, uh, people suffering from poor can climbing up the ladder. So that's the first point. Secondly, uh, fiscal policy for graduation program and other programs must be made uh, effective and sustainable. Uh, on expenditure side, uh, we must increase spending on the programs with uh, more efficient and more effective program design, and also uh, complementary investments such as education, universal health coverage, social protection program, um, uh, national pension system, uh, long-term care for the aging uh, uh, developing economies. Uh, I think also uh, I am from the insurance scheme. So all, all these um, uh, programs should be uh, nicely uh, uh, nested into a unified uh, uh, budgetary uh, framework. Uh, I firmly believe the use of uh, innovative data will be uh, very critical. And at the same time, I think a scientifically validated uh, product program or scientific validation and uh, uh, hard evidence are very, very important. So I think uh, what the IPA has been doing and JPR has been doing is really an uh, indispensable component to make a program, whole program, uh, fiscally sustainable so that the um, uh, government is not uh, putting money in a leaky bucket. And uh, Mr. Uh, Abed also said that linking graduation program to other social uh, protection program, I think that this is really important, uh, somewhat related to the first point, but um, in terms of fiscal sustainability, I think linkage is also important. And the revenue side, uh, policy option, uh, broad, broadening a tax base, making income taxes more progressive, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and introducing uh, inheritance and property taxes to strong, strengthening a tax uh, administration and correction are important. And this is actually uh, one of the uh, uh, main agenda uh, current uh, uh, president, Eli Prince Asakawa is trying to uh, build up. And finally, uh, government uh, uh, governance uh, reforms uh, of the public sector uh, must continue to ensure the uh, entire uh, population can enjoy adequate uh, po public services, leveling uh, level playing field and uh, equal access to opportunities. So I think a broader uh, governance uh, reforms are also uh, necessary to make a graduation program, uh, that program really um, uh, uh, generate um, uh, uh, development impact and um, uh, uh, also uh, uh, facilitate uh, 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 all the program uh, works uh, very well. And the linking uh, last uh, missing uh, last one mile. So with that, I'd like to stop. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Okay, thank you very much, Luarisan, for that really comprehensive answer and, a, uh, and, and some guidance on uh, the importance of creating graduation programs within the constellation overall of social protection programs and the challenges going forward in terms of financing and other, and other reforms. Um, we have a few more minutes left, so I'd like to maybe uh, first return to Shamaran and ask him a question on targeting. Um, and in light of the COVID-19 crisis, what are some of the lessons on targeting interventions like graduation when an entire population has been impacted by an external shock? Um, should there be universal response in its immediate wake? How do you, how do you balance and what is, the, what is the right approach? Yeah, thanks very much. I think there should be uh, uh, you know, much more comprehensive response on, on, on certain things. So for example, in, again, as I said, uh, during the days of lockdown and, and immediately afterwards, when we were trying to get out and provide, uh, you know, better social protection schemes, obviously you need to cover much more, uh, you know, the urban and the rural poor who are facing challenges due to the pandemic. But at the same time, I don't think uh, the reality is that because there's been a pandemic, there's been a huge impact of that on poverty, that everybody now is in ultra poverty. I think, I think poverty is still very much, I mean, the households in poverty are still very much uh, heterogeneous and not homogenous. And, you know, what we've seen, again, from over the last one year, there, the, we've seen a lot of people who are not poor, who are not in poverty, households that have fallen into poverty. So this, there is a whole group now we're calling the new poor. Uh, you know, newly poor as a result of the pandemic, right? Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they're they're in the same situation as the households we target in ultra poverty, but this is a new this is a group that is you know from BRAC's perspective, and I know many other organizations are trying to figure out you know how do we try to how do we you know uh, support these households, and we've got a new program going which takes some elements of graduation, uh, but it's not a full fledged graduation program to deal with the new poor. Then there were, you know, there are households that were poor that are now newly in ultra poverty or extreme poverty or ultra poverty. And, you know, then obviously we need to look at how do we bring them into graduation type programs. So uh, for definitely there is a lot more people that need, that need graduation type programs now as opposed to one year ago. I think there's a lot many more people in ultra poverty, uh, but there is still a need for targeting because it's, it's still not uh, I don't think we should fall into the trap of thinking now everybody's now fallen into ultra poverty and we don't need to target between who are the new poor, who are already poor and now poorer, and who is now in ultra poverty, who should be getting the full graduation package. Of course, graduation on the face of it, you know, it still needs to be targeted very well to the right households because on the face of it, it is expensive, even though we firmly believe that it's well worth the investment and you get it back many times. Uh, but the need for targeting is still very, very important. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, and maybe another question over to uh, Dean, and then maybe Karen, you also want to you you also want to chime in on this. Um, what future areas of research on graduation or economic inclusion and social protection do you suggest would be most relevant for for governments, um, both in terms of the immediate crisis, but also just in general going forward? Um, <clears throat> so, look for the for the immediate crisis. I think we we. I think there was a, a, a very early struggle, which was that a lot of times cash transfers are done um, out of a desire for humanitarian help, but with a fear that labor supply will cut back. This is a, you know, a conflict all over the world. Now, luckily, the evidence actually, luckily for those of, you know, who you know, kind of want to do the program because of its positive um, attributes, uh, the evidence is actually fairly, fairly consistent in, in showing that labor supply does not cut back with cash transfer programs. Now, the irony is when, when COVID hit, is that a lot of the motivation for cash transfer programs there was actually deliberately to try to help make it so that labor supply could cut back. So that households that are facing um, difficult times because of the economic shutdowns that took place in the lockdowns didn't feel like didn't weren't so desperate for food that they had to go into a market and and work and engage in that way and and then and thus further the spread and so there was actually you know it was it was um i don't want to say ironic but there was you know a very different motivation and for the for the cash transfers under covid 
than we historically see, where the, the goal is humanitarian relief that hopefully then fuels entrepreneurial activity and labor supply and makes it go up. And that, and like I said, that's the evidence does actually support a positive impact on these things. Whereas in this you know, bizarre world that we have found ourselves in, the goal was actually a bit the opposite there. Um, I think you know, we're still seeing some evidence come in as to whether it has did have that effect of helping people maintain some food security while reducing their need to go into the market and engage in, 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 you know, in, in that way. Um, so that, that's my, you know, I, you know, I think for the graduation model had a, had a challenge during this, during this space, of course, because to the extent that the programs are very much about trying to build, build livelihoods and require a lot of interaction, they, they obviously are, have, a, have a deep problem to implement. And I know a lot of programs struggled with how, how and when to do the, the outreach. Um, it's one of the reasons that, you know, that there might be a path. I mentioned this earlier, you, um, and you said you wanted me to come back to it about technology. I wasn't actually meaning anything deep on that when I said technology. I mean, two things, um, cell phones, right? Um, and, and also videos, which um, videos, tablets, things like this, where there can be um, kind of pre-recorded messages that are motivating, that build hope and uh, help, hope and aspirations. Um, the the types of videos than the film that we used in the in Sahel in West Africa were were basically stories that were told about people like them and how they how they achieved things in life and trying to establish role models. And so they were like many 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 stories of documentaries or. Kind of dramas that that helped inspire people. Um, there's a there's a group in in, in the Philippines, um, ICM, that I, I think many people are probably here familiar with, and we're in the middle of talking with them about um, testing out a similar similar kind of film in in um, as it overlaps on top of a graduation program that we're going to roll out with them in in the Philippines. So hopefully we can learn there about that. And so that's part of what I mean by technology. It's not I don't mean anything super super technical, but um, but you know the ability to make it so that interaction with households can be customized and also dis distant yet still meaningful can possibly you know can be achieved with the right tools to manage those that communication um, by sending messages, sending videos, um, making that two way. Um, obviously, there's literacy issues to overcome. I'm not saying these are trivial, but that's basically what I was referring to there. And, and I think that is a path forward under kind of a COVID world as well, which hopefully we won't return to in the future, but you know, maybe we need to be ready for how to think about these issues should, should we have to. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Karen or, or Salada Hassan, did you want to say anything in reference to this uh, future agenda for research? I'd be happy to, Wendy. Um, you know, I think one big question is still let's say in normal times, uh, how to bring the cost of graduation programs down, uh, because it is quite an expensive, big push type program. And, you know, we've heard several people mention that already this morning. And we in the Philippines to do this, tried to test different variations of the coaching in person, uh, looking at group based coaching. Um, and we'll talk about this more this morning. Of course, the group based coaching uh, doesn't work as well in COVID times. And that's why I'm excited about some of the things Dean just mentioned, using technology and so on. But I would also suggest that, you know, perhaps the group-based co coaching worked very well in the Philippines for particular reasons, but might not work elsewhere. So I think in other countries, the context has to be considered and we have to look at different methods uh, to try to, to bring the costs down. Obviously, ideally we would have the individual coaching you know, we can all use some coaching every now and then, uh, but given the you know fiscal constraints, that would be one area of research. And then if I may, I just want to quickly come back to the targeted versus not targeted and, and just make the distinction between immediate crisis response and then longer term programs. So in the COVID crisis, I do feel that a universal response to a universal crisis is called for. Whoops, I think we just lost Karen. So uh, Sawadasa, maybe I can throw uh, this over to you quickly for the, for the final uh, comment on the research agenda. 
Oh, yeah, uh, so yes, I, I, I agree. In order to uh, make a program more cost effective, use of uh, technology is a key. So I think uh, there are lots of uh, potential innovation we can tap. And uh, another thing I emphasize in my uh, first intervention is uh, government can also use the um, different type of uh, innovative data, such so as imagery, mob mobility data, core data record, uh, text analytics, NSS data, et cetera, et cetera, uh, to better design and deliver. Uh, the graduation program. So I think that is a broader uh, issue. And um, uh, finally, um, um, for the uh, targeted or non-targeted uh, interventions, as um, uh, Professor Benerjee said, uh, uh, there has been accumulation of uh, uh, you know, effect effective uh, universal uh, 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 basic income uh, programs around the globe. So I think um, uh, this evidence we need to carefully um, uh, you know, uh, study. And, uh, but from the respect of ADB, I think uh, one area uh, universal coverage is important is uh, universal health coverage, UHC. And um, uh, you know, I, I think uh, COVID really highlighted importance of UHC, um, uh, making everybody can access uh, quality health services they need without uh, suffering from any uh, financial hardship. So I thought uh, UHC is the one area uh, we also uh, need to uh, you know, link to the global, uh, I mean, graduation uh, program from now on. But, but over to you, uh, Wendy. Okay, thank you so much. And I really want to thank each one of the uh, panelists today. This was a very exciting and interesting start to this uh, uh, couple of days event. And you really helped to um, not only give the full view and overview of graduation approach and the programs and the evidence and on, on impact, uh, but also to put it in the context of the immediate crisis which we're facing now and the recovery challenges going forward and the potential role that it can play. So I think that this has been a wonderful way to kind of frame things for the discussions over the next couple of days. Um, just a couple of uh, takeaways, which I've also been having some help to, to come in and, and pull together from this very rich discussion. Um, the first is um, that we need to learn how to mix um, how to mix up the cash and graduation paths and to study um, how to use which path where um, and for who. And I think that that's really um, about uh, helping to frame graduation programs within the broader constellation of social protection programs and how they can link together. And that uh, cash transfers ensure that people can meet their basic needs, but can be scaled during crises. But poverty is more is 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 multidimensional, and integrating pro uh, programs like graduation can offer the assets, skills, and coaching to build this longer-term resilience, not just to immediate shocks, but to to life in general. And that uh, coaching and mentoring is particularly transformational. Um, and uh, evidence was given by uh, Professor Banerjee and, other, and, and others about that. And that uh, one of the key vulnerabilities that uh, Shamaran also raised was about uh, social marginalization and integrating the ultra poor into their communities and the role that these programs can take. And also importantly, that one uh, really big uh, gap area and will probably be, or, or um, challenge area that will probably be uh, much more discussed in the coming days is on the challenge to, um, of urban poverty and reaching the urban ultra poor and what types of uh, um, transformations need to happen to programs to be able to do that effectively. Um, that also, um, goes to one of the biggest uh, missing middle uh, uh, sections of uh, social protection coverage in general in Asia and Pacific. And it will be very important to be looking at this type of program as, a, as an intervention there. I apologize for the slightly shorter break, but I think this was a really interesting discussion. And I thank you all so much for uh, joining all, all participants and especially the presenters for the wonderful remarks that you made today. Thank you. Yeah. Turn it over to Lani. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wendy. Everybody. Thank you, Wendy and panelists. Uh, Wendy, I couldn't agree with you more. That was a really good use of our time. But yes, we are going to shorten our break to five minutes. So we'll be returning at 10.25 a.m. Manila time, uh, even though the slide will say 10 minutes. So when we come back, we will then move into the session entitled Engaging Governments on Graduation and Economic Inclusion. So see you in five minutes. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I think we'll start with the next session. Um, so once again, welcome back everyone to the next session, Engaging Governments on Graduation and Economic Inclusion. I am Yukiko Ito, Senior Social Development Specialist at ADB. Hello to everyone. Uh, so for this session, I am happy to reintroduce my colleague, Karen Selshik, Principal Social Sector Specialist of East Asia Department based in Beijing, ADB, who will be moderating this session. But before I hand the floor to Karen, I'd like to invite you all during the session to share any questions or comments you may have on the upcoming presentations in the chat box. Uh, we will select a few and a couple of questions given um, the time permitting for the presenters to address at the end of their sessions. So with this, over to you, Karen, please go ahead. Thanks, Yuki, uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Karen, uh, and I am in the ADB office in Beijing, so I'm going to apologize right now if my connection gets a little bit unstable, uh, and I'll ask my colleague Lauren to, to jump in if I freeze. Um, we are going to start the session uh, with a presentation on the building blocks of graduation programs, uh, taking you back to the basics. Uh, and then we're going to focus in on the Philippines. Uh, first, we'll screen a short video to introduce you to our recently completed pilot. Then we'll turn over to the Department of Labor uh, and Employment to hear about some lessons from implementation. And finally, we'll ask some BRAC colleagues to share implementation insights. So let's load that presentation uh, in which we are going to focus on equipping governments with an understanding of what it takes to design and budget for graduation programs. We'll provide some illustrations from ADB supported interventions. And we'd like to highlight two aspects, the foundation of social assistance that graduation builds on and the enabling conditions for successful programming and impact. Next slide, please. As we go through the presentation, uh, please do share questions or comments you have in the chat box so we can select a few to address in our Q&A uh, toward the end. In this slide, uh, we've shown you our logo, uh, our infographic that tries to capture how graduation programs combine interconnected support services for the poorest and most vulnerable to address the multiple dimensions of poverty that we spoke about this morning. Starting with social protection in the darker green part at the top, the other elements of graduation follow, including the coaching and mentorship, livelihoods, social empowerment, and financial inclusion. The exact design of each of these components will differ from context to context, as will the tailored graduation criteria by which we measure success, but these are the basic core elements. You might have also heard different names for graduation uh, since they're sometimes called economic inclusion or productive inclusion, or simply as cash plus programs to indicate that they include, but go on beyond uh, cash transfers and basic consumption support. On the next slide, uh, you will see uh, these building blocks of graduation uh, and that it's a methodology that can leverage existing government systems and programs for a particular target group using social assistance and other government programs like livelihoods, agriculture, nutrition and health programming, and, and several others. A key message is that in setting up a graduation program, you don't have to start from scratch, uh, and few governments truly do. This graphic illustrates both the elements of graduation as well as the sequencing and the, the time-bound nature of the interventions. So across the bottom, you'll see the timing in months of these average programs, which run for about two years, give or take. And you'll notice that the elements of social protection, financial inclusion, and social empowerment start first, 
Then the graduation programs offer technical and business training well before the asset transfer actually takes place. Uh, and what's not shown on this slide is the detailed market assessment that usually happens before people select and receive their asset uh, to make sure there are viable value chains in place. On the right hand side of the slide, if you'll just go back briefly, uh, you'll see uh, the expected outcomes uh, in terms of sustainable livelihoods and resilience. And the exciting thing about this approach is that there's so much evidence, so much consistent evidence that shows lasting progress with continued improvement in these indicators, like savings and access to financial services, uh, psychological resilience, long after the graduation program interventions come to an end. Next slide, please. And we can go to the next one as well. Uh, I'll illustrate how these different building blocks work in practice with a few ADB supported examples. Uh, we were quite busy in 2020, uh, initiating several new programs, completing a first pilot and producing knowledge products. Um, and what might be actually particularly of interest um, and pertaining to something that Shamran said earlier is that we've started adapting graduation to some relatively new contexts, uh, including in urban areas uh, and in income restoration programs for people who are affected by resettlement. If you'll move to the next slide. Uh, I'll just give you some brief introductions to a few of our initiatives here because we'll go into more detail later. But the first uh, is the original pilot with the Department of Labor and Employment, which we're now evaluating together with the partners that you can see here on the slide. And the idea here was to test three different variations of graduation to see whether we could achieve, uh, achieve the same or similar impact uh, through group-based livelihood assets and group-based coaching, where the standard approach is usually the individual assets and coaching. The results were so promising, uh, even despite the pandemic, that um, the Department of Social Welfare and Development is now rolling out a new iteration uh, with twice as many households and adopting the group-based coaching with individual livelihood assets, working through its Sustainable Livelihoods Program, which also targets cash transfer recipients. To illustrate how graduation builds on existing government programs, let me request that we move to the next slide, please. Uh, and uh, show you that the graduation elements of our pilot were layered onto two existing national programs. The first is the Kabuhayan Livelihood Program with the Department of Labor and Employment. You see uh, that kind of dark green in the graphic on the right. The second was the Pantawid Familian Filipino Program, uh, which is a conditional cash transfer program through the Department of Social Welfare and Development. In the graphic, it's in blue. Uh, the text is coming up in my screen on light yellow. That's meant to be blue as well, so you can pretend. Um, but the graduation additions are shown in orange. So using these existing programs has a clear effect on budgeting and the cost of programming, given that relatively few components are completely new. Most of the elements like cash transfers that support consumption, behavior change communication, employment support, technical and vocational education and training, these things exist. They predate graduation programs. And so they imply low or no added costs, especially uh, when you factor in that graduation programming has a clear time limit, as I illustrated a little bit earlier. In fact, I wanna point out that this realization um, about existing building blocks is exactly how the Philippines pilot originally came about. I've been working closely on the cash transfer program uh, and in generally in the Philippines for several years. And I first learned of the graduation approach through that impact evaluation uh, in six countries that was done by Professor Banerjee and Dean Carlin and others that Sawada San just mentioned. And you know, I realized that so many of these elements, so many of these building blocks were already in place in the Philippines. They were just maybe not done by the same agency or the same department or with the same beneficiaries in a harmonized or sequenced way. 
So that inspired the pilot, and I know the same is true in, in several other countries. On slide nine, the next slide, uh, I want to summarize two initiatives in urban areas uh, to introduce graduation programming to supplement resettlement activities. One is in the Philippines, the other in India. You know, I think we all know that involuntary resettlement is among the more disruptive shocks a poor household can face, uh, and livelihood restoration is both the most difficult aspect of involuntary resettlement and tends to be the least well implemented. Uh, unfortunately, the outcomes for affected people around the region haven't always been positive. So these are the first two applications by ADB with its partners uh, of this holistic package of support as for displaced people in urban areas in the Metro Manila area um, and north in the Philippines and Tamil Nadu, placing a strong emphasis on the mentoring component for the psychosocial support. In the next slide, uh, this final example of a planned ADB support uh, is a program in Mongolia, also in an urban context, that's going to build on the existing social welfare system. Mongolia's urban poverty challenges are considerable, and the Ministry of Labor and Social Protection has been grappling with how to promote productive employment among social transfer recipients. So we're supporting this demonstration under the second shock responsive social protection project, which is a lending operation supplemented by technical assistance provided as a grant. And that program, that graduation program, will harness the skills of existing social workers for the coaching and mentoring component and training providers for the livelihood skills. In the next slide, uh, this is the final slide of, of part one. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate the key point that graduation can leverage existing government systems and investments to amplify their impact. I also want to emphasize that ADB can support governments to incorporate economic inclusion aspects into social protection or other programs that aim at poverty reduction or livelihood restoration, as we're doing in the Philippines, India, and Mongolia, through a combination of technical assistance, lending operations, and knowledge generation and sharing. And now to take you through part two, I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Lauren Whitehead. She's the Director of Technical Assistance at the Brack Jopur Graduation Initiative, joining us from New York today. Over to you, Lauren. Wonderful, thank you, Karen. Um, and thanks very much everyone uh, for all your attention so far. Um, we know that some great questions have been coming in through the chat box and the Q&A, so we will turn to those shortly after this next portion, portion of the presentation. So in this portion of the presentation, I'm going to be speaking a little bit more about specifically what it looks like when you design graduation programs for scale with governments. So one of the first things that we focus on uh, in working in terms of design, program design elements with graduation, is assessing who to target and how that targeting process will be carried out. Um, as I think you've heard mentioned earlier today from Professor Banerjee and, um, and from others as well, Poverty is highly heterogeneous and therefore there is no sort of one size fits all solution. Um, and that's part of why we focus on the targeting element of graduation. So recognizing that in a time like COVID-19, um, where we look at a massive covariate shock that's affected the global population writ large, yes, there is a need for shock responsive responses as some might call them or immediate emergency assistance responses as others might call them as well. Um, but when we think about something, again, as Karen mentioned, that's a long-term approach that we're looking at, a program design that is going to be targeted to a specific group based on those needs. We think about graduation in terms of its comprehensive and holistic nature and which part of the population would benefit most from such an intervention as that. Um, again, that doesn't discredit any other interventions that are perfectly well tailored for certain populations, but looking at what can the combinatory approach of graduation do um, and whom can it best benefit. And so, in order, to the, in order to do that, when we look at the foundation of targeting within government graduation programs, again, these are not built from scratch. We're utilizing existing mechanisms and resources that exist within governments already, including national registries, for example, many of which are used to develop the basis of households that are eligible for cash transfer programs, for livelihoods programs, for agricultural subsidies, and so forth. Um, what graduation typically does, however, is recognizes that many national registries 
might be out of date given how frequently that they're updated. Um, they might miss certain hard to reach populations, especially, especially among the extreme poor and even the ultra poor. Um, and they don't always pinpoint the exact characteristics that would identify a household that can benefit the most from a comprehensive approach like graduation. So to, to supplement some of these targeting methodologies, um, we might start with a national registry and then build on top of that with a targeting verification survey, which is a form of a household survey. Um, with additional proxy means testing using specific part poverty profiles. Um, we might look at geographic targeting of particular regions that were hardest hit due to a particular type of shock, such as a cyclone, famine, or an earthquake or other form of disaster. Um, we might even utilize participatory wealth ranking, which enables the community to have a stake in, in essentially determining what relative levels of poverty look like in that community. So graduation really does harness the existing targeting mechanisms that a government might have in place and then layers those with additional targeting mechanisms to really pinpoint who will benefit most from this comprehensive support versus who might benefit perfectly well existing on cash transfer programs, other resources and other opportunities. On the next slide, um, we look a little bit more closely at what exactly are some of the vulnerabilities and barriers that are identified in order to pinpoint who might be best targeted for a graduation program. So at the outset of a graduation program during a, a critical assessment phase, we determine what the most pressing barriers and needs are facing a population in order to essentially ask what's holding that household back? Why is that household not able to ascend? Why does that household not achieve the upward mobility we might anticipate? And what would it take to build the resilience of that household so that when an idiosyncratic shock, like something that might happen to a single family or a covariate shock, like something of the nature of COVID-19, which affects a massive amount of the population, what might make those households more resilient because of the vulnerabilities and barriers that they experience? Um, Sometimes when we're looking at these kinds of needs and doing this sort of assessment, we also look at specific types of populations to see what kind of unique needs they might have. If it's a resettled population, for example, if it's a displaced or refugee population, if it's a population of persons living with disabilities, um, youth, rural workers, or in urban settings as well, which I know we'll speak about as, and I know that there were questions as well about what does graduation look like in an urban setting. It doesn't look exactly like what you would see identically in a rural setting. All of these factors are taken into account in order to then determine what the most pressing needs and barriers are that households face, which then leads us to the next step, which is in actually designing the interventions. When we go about designing interventions, especially in a government program, we're very frequently looking for what programs already exist that can be leveraged to meet some of these needs. And then we identify what gaps there are thereafter. Um, in order to do this though, it doesn't require just looking at the programs or support that one ministry or one department might provide. It requires actually looking across the full landscape of resources that could or should be available to a certain population. So that might mean even looking at an anchor ministry, such as a ministry of social welfare or social development, social protection, that's interested in implementing graduation, and then asking the question of, what other ministries also have a, a responsibility or a mandate to serve poor populations? And in what ways are they carrying that out? Are there agricultural subsidies, rice subsidies, food subsidies that would be available for this target population? Are there certain livelihoods programs or interventions, skills training that's available for a certain population, et cetera, et cetera. We don't also just look at the national level. We also look at the local level within local government. Um, that might be at a district level, provincial level, municipal level, and so forth, state level. And part of what we are doing there is to ascertain what additional resources could be layered into a graduation approach from across the broad base of resources that the government is already investing. In a way, this is enabling a multiplier effect of resources that a government has already um, allocated to a particular population or to a larger population and combining and focusing those resources such that it can actually activate a big push to help propel people from extreme poverty and ultimately from poverty. When we think about 
um, which ministries to engage, for example, what types of interministerial collaboration to encourage. Um, we also ask the question of how to break, break down silos between ministries. Sometimes you'll find that a particular ministry will feel that a certain population sort of um, belongs to that ministry or is under the purview and responsibility of that ministry to the exclusion of other ministries. And what we try to work on is ascertaining where there are commonalities between the populations that ministries are serving or where there could or should be commonalities that can then be leveraged even at a, a testing or pilot phase that could then be scaled. Um, this is really a critical, a critical portion of the graduation program design to ensure that the graduation program will actually be able to have sustainability. When graduation exists within just one ministry, for example, it's quite easy for that as a program rather than as a methodology to be removed over time with a given administration, with giving given ebbs and flows. So when you find that it is nestled across multiple ministries and furthermore, when it's nestled within the policy landscape, that's where we find the greatest staying power for graduation as a methodology and not as a standalone program. So we can go to the next slide, please. Wonderful. So one other element we assess when we look at the landscape of potential stakeholders that can support graduation um, are including ministries and across different government departments, but also outside of those as well, looking at the private sector, looking at NGOs, even looking at microfinance institutions, financial service providers, and so forth. Um, and part of why we look at these partnerships is, again, thinking about the holistic perspective of graduation along those four pillars that Karen mentioned earlier, livelihoods promotion, social protection, financial inclusion, and social empowerment, along with the coaching and mentorship piece that's kind of the critical element in the middle. What you see represented here is thinking about that coaching and mentorship piece. Very often, governments might recognize that coaching and case management is not necessarily something that they have immediate resources for or have trained staff with capacity to do. In those cases, um, many graduation programs might activate partnerships um, on a temporary basis, sometimes a long-term basis, but always with a critical capacity building component with NGOs, for example, that might help execute on some of that case management work with governments where governments are actually able to execute on case management, there are a number of different forms that coaching takes. And I think it's useful to think back to something uh, that was mentioned earlier today, uh, where I believe Dean, uh, Dean Carlin and Professor Banerjee both talked about this sort of X factor, essentially, that there is around coaching, where we recognize that there's some sort of psychological effect that happens during mentorship, and that there's a form of psychosocial support that people are receiving that in many cases is as important, if not in some cases more important than some of the other elements of the intervention. Um, coaching is often seen, especially BRAC, we found in our experience in many different geographies, working with many different government partners, that coaching is really the linchpin um, in the graduation program. And you see this played out time and again in many studies that show where you provide just an asset or just cash, and for certain populations, it's just not enough. And so what we often ask ourselves and what our government partners often ask us is, how do you approach case management? How do you approach coaching when you have limited financial resources, for example, um, when it might seem human resource intensive and therefore costly? Some say that coaching might be as much as half or a third of the cost of a graduation program outside of the asset and other interventions, for example. There are many different ways that this is done, um, and we'd be happy to talk more on this with anyone who has further questions, but outside of the traditional model of individual coaching that you also often see in graduation programs, there's also uh, group coaching, which is something that Karen mentioned was tested in the Philippines and is now being scaled to additional provinces with the Department of Social Welfare and Development. There's remote coaching, which is something that has been activated during COVID-19 using SMS text messages, using phone calls, and even using phone trees whereby households check on other households in sort of a peer, um, peer accountability network, particularly when coaches aren't able to go into communities during COVID-19 lockdown period. There's also elements of volunteer coaching that's utilized, whereby a coaching or case management function with salaried staff is actually supplemented with local community volunteers who can make more frequent visits on a periodic basis and incentivize structure to households as well. 
There's peer coaching methodologies that have been used whereby individual role models in a particular community are elevated, trained, and then able, able to actually serve as coaches and co-mentors with their other peers. Um, there's also strong tides around repurposing existing community workers, such as community health workers and social workers, um, being able to expand their skill set and, and responsibilities when they're actually attending to household needs. This is because many of the households that actually need a comprehensive and holistic support like graduation tend to be those that might be targeted for something like community health worker interventions or social worker interventions, for example. And then of course, there are digital technologies, which uh, Dean alluded to earlier, that have all been used to find more ways to make co coaching elements more cost-effective. So there are a number of different ways. When it comes to graduation programs, there really is no one size fits all. And that definitely applies to coaching as well. Um, we can go to the next slide here, please. Thank you. And so in this last example, just thinking about key design considerations, we wanted to also focus on something that's central to graduation um, and perhaps even more so than some other integrated development approaches might be, which is the focus on monitoring robust, rapid monitoring. And the purpose of this monitoring is not just for tracking performance indicators to say we've, we've trained this many households or we've distributed this many assets. This is monitoring for actual household progress against a set of graduation criteria. Um, and the reason why this monitoring takes place is to actually be able to relay the progress and roadblocks that a household is facing in real time to coaches in order to be able to tailor the responses that are provided to those households. There's some ways that that's standardized, for example, using push messages. If you find a household is consistently struggling in the financial inclusion pillar of the program, being able to target financial um, inclusion information and financial literacy training, for example, to that household. If you find that a household is really struggling in terms of health and worsening health in that household, um, diarrheal diseases and waterborne illnesses and so forth, being able to actually target better health messaging to achieve stronger health outcomes. The graduation criteria specifically are what's used to determine if a household has graduated. And I think this is important to note because very often it's misconstrued that graduation exists only in time bound fashion and only after that time period does everyone magically graduate. Um, but what we actually consider to be graduated are households that have met this plethora of graduation criteria that combine both social and economic factors. And the reason why those are combined is in order to ensure that households actually achieve resilience because it's only through achieving resilience that they can continue on a path and fortunately, hopefully not slide back due to idiosyncratic shocks that they might experience as an individual family. So digital monitoring is one of the most rapid ways in which monitoring is being done across a number of graduation programs using many open source platforms that are free and available to governments um, as well and other partners that are interested in linking to MIS. But I think one thing that's very important is that all of these digital systems link into existing government MIS or can be connected to existing government monitoring information systems. Um, and this is again, recognizing what Karen mentioned before, which is that graduation is not built from scratch. It is built to be integrated into existing government programs. Um, and to close here, just two more briefly things I wanted to touch on. Um, one was just to show a representation of some of the areas in which BRAC is currently or in the near future working with partners in Asia and Pacific. Um, so as you saw mentioned earlier from our senior director of microfinance and the ultra poor graduation program, um, Shamran Abed, we've been operating in Bangladesh now for nearly 20 years, having graduated around 2 million households in Bangladesh, which is one of the largest scaled programs and is also the lo longest longitudinal study of a graduation program with evidence dating to about 10 years ago, um, ten, excuse me, 10 years for the population that has been served in Bangladesh. We have 20 years worth of monitoring data and 10 years worth of randomized control trial data from our impact evaluation. Um, we're also working with ADB and partners in Tamil Nadu in India, as well as, as Karen mentioned, with the government of the Philippines, which will be speaking later today, um, particularly to talk about the 
two different areas in which we've been working with the government to help them implement graduation. And we know that our colleagues in Jivika have been hard at work on their graduation program, which they're scaling to reach 100,000 households, one of the largest scaled government graduation programs in the world. And um, they'll be speaking with some tomorrow regarding that. And not pictured here as well is in Pakistan, where we're also working with the World Bank and the um, Southern Punjab Poverty Alleviation Project to help the government there as well implement graduation. So a number of different instances across Asia. And on this next slide here, um, this is where we wanted to just touch very briefly before uh, closing on how graduation helps truly invest in economic resilience for households. So we've mentioned some of the myriad benefits of graduation in terms of psychosocial support, in terms of social protection and meeting basic needs, um, in terms of financial inclusion and so forth, social empowerment. Um, but when we really look at some of the, the core elements of graduation, it really does point towards economic resilience and building up that resilience of households ex ante before they encounter a shock like COVID-19, for example. Um, so what we think about as graduation, what we can think about now in terms of recovery from COVID-19 is how do we place households on stronger pathways during this recovery period so that they are better prepared for the next big shock, the next big COVID-19 that might happen, the next big natural disaster that might happen. And we do see graduation as a very viable path for that. Graduation does this because of the targeting that I mentioned and really segmenting households to better understand their needs so that you can provide as comprehensive or as not comprehensive um, a package of support as, is, as beneficial for that particular household. We have the trained frontline staff through the coaches that have that rapid iterative monitoring that takes place, which enables an inbuilt flexibility to adapt fairly quickly. And this is something that's not very common of many government programs, for example, that are set out at the on an annual cycle and don't necessarily have the chance to iterate or evolve or move as the households and as the population's needs move. Um, Karen mentioned earlier that there's a foundation of a localized market study, which is used to determine what assets and livelihoods will be provided to households. Um, there's identification of local service providers for financial services. And then there are also very strong linkages um, to national government, local government, and community resources. Across all of these dimensions is part of how graduation helps build people's resilience to future shock. It gives them capital to invest in enterprises or skills training to move on a formal employment pathway. You have access to financial services to grow that income as it comes in, access to savings to maintain and prepare for future shocks. And then you have many linkages to markets, to resources, to government programming, et cetera, that helps bolster your ability to um, counter shocks. And on this last slide, just to close before we go to questions, um, I just wanted to close by saying that there is much work to be done as we move from now, recovering from COVID-19, moving towards 2030, and hopefully towards attainment of the sustainable development goals or as close as we can, given this massive setback globally. And very often we talk about graduation as it relates to, of course, SDG 1, which is the eradication of poverty in all its forms. But in addition to that, many don't often know that graduation meets a number of different sustainable development goals. Um, graduation contributes to the SDG 2 on, on zero hunger, SDG 3 on health and well being, SDG 5 on gender equality, especially given the focus on women's economic empowerment that's so common to graduation programs. SDG 8 on providing decent work and economic growth for households, especially those who are frequently at the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to economic opportunities. And of course, SDG 10 on reducing global inequality. So working together through graduation, which in and of itself is a holistic and combinatory approach is how we truly can get to a direction of making sure that there is no one left behind in 2030 or thereafter. So thank you very much for your time and we welcome your questions. Thanks for that, Lauren. Um, I wanted to hone in on a point you made on the second to last slide about how graduation is about building resilience before the shock happens. Um, and that sort of distinguishes graduation uh, from immediate crisis response. You wouldn't scramble to start a graduation program to cope with a crisis today, but it's really about building up that resilience through all those integrated 
aspects that you covered. Um, and we've been monitoring the chat box, uh, and I have a couple of questions that I've picked out. Um, Lauren, if you would comment, um, one question is, what are some of the lessons learned or challenges that BRAC can share about implementing graduation in urban areas? Uh, and here, maybe we could say urban and peri-urban, as opposed to the traditional very rural programs. Sure, very happy to answer that, Karen. Um, yes, so I think there are a few things that have been learned from urban and peri-urban environments. And I would say that this is an area that's quite ripe for further study. Um, and this is partially why there's so many programs that are actually being launched in urban areas now. So in Bangladesh, BRAC has operated an urban program for a number of years, even in the work that um, we were able to do with the Department of Labor and Employment in the Philippines. There's been an urban and peri-urban component to that work. Um, the work that's ongoing now with resettled households with ADB and, and the um, Tamil Nadu Slum Clearance Board in Tamil Nadu, India also is focusing on urban populations. And I think we found a number of different things. Um, one is that when you're looking at those needs, vulnerabilities, barriers, like I was talking about before, um, the needs and the vulnerabilities are, are quite different, which might seem obvious and apparent, but not in the ways that you would always anticipate. So for example, we often found that because so many programs are targeted at the rural poor, there weren't necessarily many social services that urban poor populations were able to access. So sometimes it wasn't a matter of linking to services, it was a matter of creating an on-ramp so they could be registered for certain services to begin with, um, or petitioning to government for them to be able to access certain services that were available to rural populations. Um, I think uh, Sharman Abed mentioned this earlier as well, that COVID-19 has exposed the fact that social protection has underserved urban populations for an extended period of time. So I would say that's something that we already observed pre-COVID in our urban um, implementation. Something else that we've observed in urban implementation is that there's a strong community focus in many graduation programs through the social empowerment element. However, when you're operating in an urban environment with high degrees of anonymity, high population density, very often people don't necessarily know their neighbors or have any sort of affinity for their neighbors and so forth. So you're actually trying to build social ties, which tend to exist more readily in rural areas where people are possibly even more dispersed, geographically dispersed from one another. Um, but that's important for building a network for households to have social capital, to have people they can rely on in times of shock, et cetera. Um, and then the third area I would mention is around the livelihoods, which is just that urban livelihoods do obviously have to look very, very different. So you tend to have much more of a focus on formal employment, for example, in hospitality sectors, for example, um, in the garment industry for in, in Bangladesh as well, in other areas. Um, the market assessment isn't necessarily pointing you to livelihoods that are livestock generated, um, but more looking at things like petty trade um, and ambulatory sales and things of that nature, or of course, formal employment as well. You know, you've just segued into my next question magically. Because, okay. <laughs> um, the next question I wanted to pull out was what kind of role the private sector or the local business community can play in graduation? Uh, this is a question from our audience. And in many ways, you've sort of just answered it uh, in that in urban areas, the graduation interventions point much more toward you know, employment facilitation uh, and sort of local value chains, not livestock uh, necessarily. So any couple of comments on that? Uh, and then- yeah. We actually only have two minutes left. So the last one I'll, I'll mention uh, is, and I've combined a couple of questions uh, that are around climate resilience. Um, you know, the poorest are often hardest hit by any kind of disaster. Uh, does the model also have any DRR, disaster risk reduction interventions? Can we share any insights in that regard? So private sector, disaster resilience. Got it, okay. Yes, so I was on that thread with the uh, private sector. <laughs> So, yes, you do see more private sector collaboration in urban areas. Some of it does come through formal employment pathways um, and actually making compacts with local formal employers um, so that they take a certain cadre of, of households that they know have been properly trained, for example, in certain skills, trades, et cetera, that they agree to provide employment pathways for. That has happened in a number of graduation programs. Um, there's also been a strong link to private sector when it comes to training. So having private sector um, partnerships around technical training around even providing livestock in rural areas, for example, or providing access to certain goods in, in uh, urban areas. So if you're setting up certain shops or you're setting up um, retail businesses or you're setting up uh, clothing and sewing, a lot of seamstress and tailoring businesses, things like that, um, where there's actually 
upstream and downstream connections in terms of market linkages, forward and backward linkages that are made with private sector through partnerships. Um, and an, an interesting thing to note is that the um, UNHCR, the UN's refugee agency, has actually done a lot around graduation, specifically linking to private sector employers and creating pathways for refugees who are traditionally left out of most uh, job landscapes when they move into a new context. So I think there's a, a ripe, ripe opportunity for a private sector to be much more involved, much more embedded, especially in urban environments. And I think we're going to see a lot more graduation programs emerging in urban areas now in the wake of COVID-19, seeing how urban populations have been underserved and so forth. So there, there will be many opportunities, I think, there. Um, and then on the other question regarding climate resilience, um, yes, there have been many graduation programs that have specifically focused on building climate resilience. The work that Dean referenced earlier in, um, in the Sahel in Western Africa, um, that work has been done with a number of different partners, including the World Bank, including Trickle Up, which is another technical assistance provider in the graduation space. Um, and that work has focused specifically on climate resilience. The work that we did with the government of Kenya as well was focusing on the arid and semi-arid lands and building resilience to climate shocks there. We're doing some work with the government of Tunisia in a similar focus. Um, and then in Bangladesh, our own program, uh, actually for certain areas, we called it the Adapting to Climate Change Destitution or ACCD graduation program, which focused particularly on building saline resistant crops for households that were living along the water's edge, for example, near the Bay of Bengal and focused on being able to provide more linkages for disaster reduction, DRR responses, disaster risk reduction and DRR responses within the community as well. So yes, there's been a lot of graduation that's been focused on climate and happy to share some resources that we have on that with anyone who's interested. Thanks so much, Lauren. And um, we're gonna move into our video in just a second, but I do want to let participants know that uh, our email addresses are on the screen if you have any other questions. Uh, we're collecting the questions in the chat box and we're gonna to try to address them throughout the day as best as we can. Uh, and so with that, thanks so much, Lauren. Uh, and let me ask our colleagues uh, to run the graduation video to introduce the Philippines pilot. This is a five minute video. Thanks, everybody. I think we're having just a quick technical issue with the sound. Uh, can we try that again? I think what you can see while they're getting that ready is that there are several videos you can find on YouTube uh, if you'd like to know more. Let's give that a go again. I'm afraid the sound is still not coming through. Um, so what we might do, if it's okay with everybody, is um, perhaps move on to speak with Assistant Secretary Alex Avila on the Philippines experience. And we could try to come back with the video again between uh, this conversation and the next one. What do you think? Or we can give it one more go. Let's see. <laughs> the graduation approach is empowering people in extreme poverty. It is a comprehensive, time-bound, and sequenced set of interventions, specifically designed to build participants' capacity to move beyond extreme poverty and into secure, sustainable, and resilient livelihoods. As we have seen during the COVID-19 pandemic, graduation is a form of social protection that helps build resilience to shocks and extends benefits far beyond the individual. The program is implemented in the province of Negros Occidental, covering five areas. 
two municipalities and three cities. The municipality of Murcia, the municipality of Imi Magalona, the cities of Silay, Talisay, and Victorias. We are covering the Pantawid Pamilya beneficiaries in the province, which they belong for to the poorest sector. Majority of our beneficiaries belong to the informal sector, mostly workers in the haciendas and small farmers. One of the biggest source of fear and apprehension is the COVID-19 pandemic. It resulted in a lot of tragedy, especially among the most in need. BRAC did not turn its back during these times. In fact, it made sure that the program was adjusted to the most needs of the participants. There were pilot activities like the use of text messages and remote check-ins, which provided information on health, safety, and guidance on how to continue successfully with livelihood efforts. The staff also tracked those who did not receive their cash assistance and coordinated with the local DSWD authority to report these cases. Pangabuyan sa Shindalo, no, iga pananom ng kami utan. Ngakon nga bana, nagobra lang sa kampo obreros, di hindi makaigo ang amon nga kita nga si Manal nga 1-8. Nagapang hulam ng kami sa amon amo. Pogali sa ka four-piece, inbuligan sa brakag doli, kag ADB. Kagintagaan ko nila sa madamo nga mga seeds, wala labot nga naghatag sa hapon sa mga seeds. Gabisita, permi nga nga po nga JCF, kagtapos madamo ko siya nga ginatuntudlo, kaginamonitor, yagid permi ang hapon nga pangabuyan. Katanong kami otan, gabaligya otan, gabaligya man itlog. Pagsugod sa pandemya, pertigid kapigado, kay hindi kami ka dali-dali lakat, kay wala sa lakyan. Hindi kami kasulod sa bakulo, dito kami gabligya utan mo. Saktogid ang paghatag isang bulig sa brak sa amon kay tungod sa pandemic. Nakabuligid ako sa bilog ng Sindalunoy kay sa amon gid sila nakakuha sa mga ng mga ulotanon. Lagi kami nagutman as nang ako ng pamilya. Dakogid ang nabulig sa brak kag damo giko nabuligan. Ang amon itlog, ginapautang ko na namon kay kabalumang kami ang mga pumuloyo. Di wala man yung nagbakal, kriyo man sa amon eh. Sa pagsugod yun sa community quarantine, wala kami nagapild, nagapagtawag lang kami sa mga beneficiaries para makommunicate namon sila, pakuha mga datos nga gikinhangla namon, especially sa monitoring sa ilang livelihood, kung nagapadayon ba sila sa pagbaligya or kung kumusta na sila, adun na pa ba sila'y income para masustinar sa ilang pamilya, adun na pa ba sila'y pagkaon. Once a month na lang kami nagabisit sa ila, then ang other half is through call na lang para ma-monitor sila dyan po na. Even if it is pandemic yet, uh, they do not hesitate no, to do other things just to be able to monitor the progress of the projects that DOLE has already funded. On the part of DOLE, we are 100% supportive of these projects. Uh, this will help also in the future policies of DOLE as regards the livelihood programs. Thank you for that lovely video. Uh, I'm glad we got there in the end, and thanks for bearing with us. Uh, I am now so pleased to introduce my colleague, uh, the Assistant Secretary for Labor Relations, Social Protection, and Policy Support of the Department of Labor and Employment uh, with the Government of the Philippines. Mr. Alex Avila has worked tirelessly on this pilot, uh, and we asked him uh, to tell us about what it was like to engage in the graduation pilot, why the Department of Labor and Employment was interested, and what uh, they think they've gained or learned from, from implementing the pilot. So if I may turn over to you, Asek Alex, it's so nice to see you again. Thank you, Karen. A pleasant morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone. I am honored to be part of this conversation 
and share with you our experience with the graduation approach in the Philippines. Next, uh, my, next slide, please. Next slide. The decision of the Department of Labor and Employment in 2018 to participate in the pilot implementation of the graduation approach in the Philippines was anchored on the desirability of exploring a holistic framework, livelihood framework, which has been found working in other national settings. We thought we needed to experiment with a new approach, something not invented in our backyard, test it in the Philippines setting and see if its positive outcomes could necessitate a paradigm shift in the way we formulate our livelihood policy implement, manage, and evaluate our livelihood program, we call it the Kabuhayan program, and promote and harness the program as a tool to help expand economic opportunities among Filipino workers, especially those in the margins of development, and in the process contribute to poverty alleviation. Next slide, please. Three years hence, and with the official completion of the pilot project last September 2020, what have we got to show? Has the pilot implementation lived up to expectations? I am pleased to share with you the following initial key findings you see on the screen at the close of the pilot last year. First, on average, 71% of the pilot households met all the contextually specific graduation criteria and thus were considered graduated. Second, participants reported knowledge retention on life skills training topics, leading to positive behavior change in health, nutrition, and hygiene practices. Third, participants were able to launch sustainable livelihoods, generate income, even during the pandemic and the quarantine period that resulted therefrom. Fourth, participants demonstrated increased savings and positive behavior change in financial management and fifth, the combination of individual livelihoods and group coaching appears to be the optimal configuration of graduation programming for government implementation. These are exactly the outcomes the Dole would like our Kabuhayan or livelihood program to deliver and sustain. In the next session, Ms. Emily Beam will present further details on the preliminary impact of the pilot project. But the initial findings I just cited give us the confidence to say that the pilot has succeeded to lay a strong foundation for resilient and sustainable livelihoods of the 1,202 graduated households in the 29 villages across five communities in Negros Occidental. Next slide, please. There are four key success factors which I think ensured the pilot success. Namely, first, um, the integration of experienced graduation community facilitators into the implementation team. These uh, community facilitators serve as the backbone of the pilot and the crucial link between the beneficiaries and the implementing partner agencies, including the local government units and village officials. Second, we see the institutionalization as another key success factor. Uh, you know, the institutionalization of the family development plan, which is uh, built on coaching and mentoring. This enabled the beneficiaries to develop and harness life skills to better manage their livelihood projects. And third, uh, we see the participation of the private sector in the program to be uh, facilitative of the success. We also consider the use of internet-based tools, uh, which ensured real-time monitoring of the livelihood projects to be the critical factor in the success. And finally, uh, the constitution of the oversight, management, and implementation structures at the central and operational levels uh, in the process ensuring unit of command 
and uh, this provided for an open space for joint planning, joint problem solving, and decision making. I should also, uh, on the next slide, we can see the, uh, of course, the challenges uh, that we encountered along the way. And as can be expected of any multi-stakeholder collaboration, where government is the main contributor of resources, the pilot project had to navigate bureaucratic mindset, processes, and practices especially with respect to fund disbursements and asset procurement. In the target communities where every second, every minute, and every hour count for household income providers, waiting for the arrival of livelihood assets for one week or even longer, means foregone income and lost, lost economic opportunities. This is the reason why more than one third of, of the original target beneficiaries opted out and decided that it was better for them to take whatever available income opportunities rather than wait for asset transfer to take place. The original plan was to complete the pilot in 18 months, that is from July 2018 to December 2019. But a combination of factors had forced the pilot to be extended until mid-2020. The onset of the COVID-19 pandemic and the community restrictions it had caused starting mid-March of 2020. Today is the anniversary of the community quarantine in the Philippines. This drastically changed the landscape, forcing recalibrations of the plan and the strategies. We will never know exactly if better outcomes would have been achieved had the pandemic not disrupted the pilot implementation. Perhaps additional dropouts could have been avoided or more than 71% of the participating households would have graduated, sustained their livelihood projects, and even earned higher incomes. But the initial outcomes I cited earlier attest to the resiliency of the beneficiaries amid a pandemic which has shut down businesses, displaced workers, and aggravated poverty situation across the world. On the next slide, I'll show you the issues and the challenges that uh, uh, I, I just shown you the challenges that the pilot had uh, were able to was able to confront and overcome. I'm not presenting now. I'm not presenting the prospects for graduation adaptation in the Philippines. This is actually my one of the main. Uh, uh, main uh, objective of my presentation. So I, I see promising windows of opportunities for graduation adaptation in the country in terms of national policies and development plans. You can see on the screen the logo of the updated Philippine Development Plan, which uh, recognizes the strategic importance of livelihood in reducing poverty and inequality and in the pursuit of sustainable rural development and ensuring better access to economic opportunities. Livelihood is recognized in at least five chapters as a cross-cutting strategy. Chapter A, Chapter 9B, Chapter 10, Chapter 20, and of course, Chapter 1. Uh, for instance, the PDP is pursuing the so-called Balik Provincia Bagong Pag-asa Program or BP2, which aims to decongest Metro Manila by encouraging residents, especially informal settlers, to return to their home provinces. Those returning will be provided assistance for transportation expenses, livelihood, housing, and education among others. BP2 will require the convergence of national government and LGU programs and projects, including livelihood programs that will not merely bring back people to the provinces, but promote sustainable communities in the countryside. Well, it will be interesting to see how the graduation approach could be adapted to inform the framing of this convergence approach and lay the foundation of viable, resilient, and sustainable livelihoods in the home communities of the returnees. Next slide, please. Another window of opportunity pertains to the uh, ongoing uh, work we are... Uh, we are... Uh, 
working with the other stakeholders in towards the development of the social protection tour in the Philippines. And we are guided in this uh, endeavor by the uh, Social Protection Plan 2020-2022. Uh, these uh, documents also include livelihood as a major program to address risk and vulnerabilities of our citizens. The adoption of a common livelihood framework across government has been recommended to ensure convergence in the holistic approach to community development. As you can see, the framework also espouses participatory and gender sensitive strategies encompassing convergence and community driven development in program delivery and the need to strengthen the role of local government units, non government organizations, and civil society organizations in program implementation. As a member of the Social Development Committee, this is a cabinet level committee and its subcommittee on social protection with the main responsibility to lead the development of the social protection floor. The Department of Labor and Employment will continue to share our insights on and experience with the graduation approach as we push for our collaborative work with all the stakeholders toward the adoption of the SPF in the country. Another window of opportunity is on slide seven on the next slide, please. There is impending full devolution of certain executive functions to the local government units starting next year. And with it, the widening fiscal space of the local government units that will enhance their capacity to provide and deliver programs and services, including livelihood. With the implementation of the 2019 Supreme Court decision mandating that the just share of the LGUs in taxes shall be derived from all national taxes starting fiscal year 2022. It is estimated that from fiscal year 2021 to 2022, the year-on-year -year increase in the shares of the LGUs will be around 56%. I think at present, it's just around 40% of the national taxes or around 1% or 1, 1 of the gross domestic product. While it is not yet clear whether the livelihood programs of national government agencies, including the dollar, would be among those to be devolved. There is bright opening for the graduation approach to be part of this process, especially with respect to LGU funded livelihood programs. The adaptation process could go side by side with the implementation of capacity development programs for and by the local government units. The experiences and outcomes obviously of the pilot project provide useful insights and real life examples for other LGUs on how resilient and sustainable livelihood programs should be designed, implemented, managed, and evaluated. Certainly, we can make a powerful case for replicating and scaling the Negros pilot project and other LGUs. Ladies and gentlemen, next slide, please. Midway through the pilot implementation in 2019, we realized that adaptation is key, but this should be done with fidelity to the core principles of the graduation approach, as you can see on the screen. First, graduation is interdisciplinary. Who has the mandate is open and clear. Interministerial or departmental coordination is difficult but necessary. Third, it is best to integrate into existing social protection programs, as mentioned uh, during the pre previous uh, discussions, and leverage current investments. For example, cash transfer program or what we call Pantawid, Filipino, the Porpoise or the Pantawid Familia Filipino Program in the Philippines. Fourth, navigating shifting political currents could be especially hard. And lastly, 
getting on board multiple champions is critical to ensure sustainability. The conclusion of the pilot actually reaffirms these initial learnings. In closing, and uh, I would like you to show the next slide, please. You can see Karen there. I, I would like to close my presentation by sharing with you these pictures I, I took in March 2019 when the Dole, ADB, BRAC, SWD, and IPA visited the livelihood projects in the pilot areas. Two of these innocent and beautiful children are the son and daughter of our beneficiary in the town of Borsia, whose livelihood project involved the production and sell selling of salted eggs. I hope that I would have another chance to see and meet these children again and personally visit the salted egg project of their mother. It will certainly be a liberating experience for me to see that the seeds of hope and empowerment we, collect, we collectively planted in their communities have positively influenced the trajectory of their lives and contributed, contributed in creating an enabling environment for empowered, resilient, and socio-economically secure households. Ultimately, the success of our graduation experiment in Negros will be best measured in terms of its contribution in creating an environment which enables these this innocent children to sleep with the roof over their heads, eat adequate and nutritious food, access quality education, enjoy their childhood and adolescence, and chart a better and brighter future for themselves and their generation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for your inspiring words, Asak Alex. You know, I, at the beginning of the presentation, you started by saying, what have we got to show? And the answer is a lot. Uh, and I especially appreciated your slides on the windows of opportunity. And I think you really illustrated something that Lauren said earlier about sustainability. And that is when graduation is nestled within the policy landscape across ministries, across different levels of government, that's when it can be most sustainable. So I think you've really illustrated that very well. Um, let's move on to our next uh, and final presentation of this session. Uh, and I'm very happy to introduce two colleagues from the BRAC Ultra Poor Graduation Initiative. Uh, Marlo Popes is a field manager. He's based in Iloilo City. And Krishti Shreshta is a technical advisor based in New York. And they were superstar field implementers of the graduation pilot in the Philippines. So we're gonna hear from them about some insights from implementation, perhaps touching on some of the things that Asik Alex just mentioned in terms of uh, both success levers and then some of the challenges. Let me just try, I know we need to shorten a little bit because of the timing, but let me give you a question up front, if that's okay. Uh, it's from the chat box. And one of our participants asked, how do you help people understand that they are going to graduate from the program? You know, what are the key processes? And is there social preparation that's involved? Uh, did you experience any challenges in that regard? So maybe you can keep that in the back of your mind and see if you can work it into uh, to some of what you present today. Over to you, Trishti and Marlo. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Karen, for the introduction. So I guess I would like to start the presentation and then Justy will come in uh, on her part of the presentation later. So uh, this afternoon, we'll be uh, sharing with you the implementation insights from the graduation approach uh, implementation in the Philippines with the Department of Labor and Employment. Uh, next slide, please. So we'll tackle first an overview, and then we'll directly uh, proceed into the key findings of the monitoring data or the monitoring activities that we've uh, conducted. Then we'll be sharing the household graduation rates or the uh, uh, key highlights of the monitoring data, key lessons learned, and some questions and answers, if time would permit, at the end of the presentation. 
Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so just a snapshot. No, uh, I think this was already discussed by uh, our previous presenters. But to highlight, no, aside from the department, the national government agencies, and international development partners and research institutions, uh, as part of the pilot uh, stakeholders, we also engage the local government units from the municipality level down to the barangay level, because they are the frontliners in providing the services to to the beneficiaries to the ultra poor. So what we did was to coordinate with them in terms of the implementation and also in terms of the coordination during the uh, during the whole duration of the pilot. And uh, by, by coordinating with them, we had support no, uh, provided no, that would also uh, that also benefited our uh, partner beneficiaries uh, of the pilot in Negros Occidental. Next slide, please. And as highlighted by Karen, uh, there's nothing. There is no new intervention with the graduation with the Dole graduation project. Uh, everything's there already in the current government programming. What we did was just to enhance the delivery of those services and added enhancements through the graduation additions. So it built up on the Dole's uh, Kabuhayan Livelihood Program and the Pantawid Familia uh, Social Assistance, no, which is the conditional cash transfer. And what we did was to uh, provide. Uh, uh, interventions in, uh, through the graduation community facilitators through intensive coaching, monitoring, and mentoring done monthly. Next slide, please. So to identify potential cost effect efficiencies for scale, you know, innovations for poverty action conducted an RCT to determine if group or individual livelihoods and coaching produce differential impacts. That's why uh, in terms of the implementation of the pilot, we have three different groups of households. We have uh, group livelihoods, group coaching. You know? So they receive um, they receive all interventions by groups. We have into purely individual, individual livelihoods and individual coaching, and a mix of those two iterations, which is individual livelihoods and group coaching. And the evaluation was also supplemented by the robust monitoring by the project staff to determine how the project affected different types of households based on their profile. So aside from the RCT, there's also robust monitoring done monthly with the graduation community facilitators. Next slide, please. So as part of all the activities, no, as, as, as um, Karin highlighted a question, how do you tell or how do you impart uh, to the participants no, about the graduation and the process of, uh, of, of them graduating or the process of them moving to that upward uh, trajectory out of poverty. We conducted a lot of activities, but I would like to highlight that that um, process no, of starting to, in, to, to let the participant know about graduation is doing during the family development plan, because that's where um, we create, you know, uh, the, 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 the beneficiary create a plan assisted by the graduation community facilitator. And the plan uh, entails what would be the um, the goals no, of the beneficiary throughout the implementation of the project, and uh, uh, that also details no, what would be the responsibilities of the of the beneficiaries. No, what are the things that they would need to highlight and improve on in their households? And by there, uh, we focus those interventions no, uh, in order to um, provide um, tailored um, services no, and interventions to the households in order to reach. Uh, uh, and improve on their household indicators through the graduation indicators that we gathered monthly with the households. So that is the highlight you know, that I think that that starts the, the process of, of um, coordinating with the household about the process of how they would graduate you know, into, um, I know, into an upward trajectory out of poverty. So other than those, uh, other than that particular you know, um, activities, we also had a lot of trainings Next slide, please. A lot of trainings, monitoring, uh, coaching, no? uh, group coaching, individual coaching. And we would like to highlight that um, we, all, we, we do uh, regular training of trainers with our, with, our, with our graduation community facilitators because we would want to invite that there is always a retooling session and learning session. And we would want to learn also from them and not just from us because they gather the information from the field. So we set up learning sessions regularly you know, just to talk about the implementation, if there are any um, new things that are happening in the field that we'd be able to, to address and collate you know, as part of the learning, learning agenda of the whole pilot. 
Next slide, please. Uh, what we what we have also is the life skills training topics no? that is included in the coaching and mentoring part of the whole project or the whole graduation approach project. Uh, this is a supplement to the family development session that is conducted by uh, the Pantawid Familia Program. But what we do is that we 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 actually realized that after they 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 participated in the family development session, the the process of learning you know, stops when they when they enter their households because there are a lot of things happening in the households. They learn a lot of topics. They learn good information from the FTS, but there's no follow up you know, when they reach their, their homes or they reach their households. So what we do is that we, we supplement the learnings through uh, tailored, you know, smaller caseload um, sessions with the households you know, uh, in, in, in their house or with their peers in, within the community. So the, the smaller caseloads of learning uh, the smaller case, uh, the smaller groups, uh, smaller number of, of participants would enable them to have peer-to-peer -peer learning, knowledge sharing with their, within their neighbors, within their co-beneficiaries, and that that uh, gives them the opportunity to also uh, share what the what the what their insights is, you know, uh, what what their what their um, experiences are uh, within that particular group of, of participants. So it is a supplement no, that. Uh, uh, to the family development sessions. Next slide, please. So this is also a highlight of the monitor of the Dolly graduation pilot, wherein we used uh, a digital monitoring. You know, uh, implemented the digital monitoring uh, through Android tablets. So we we uh, programmed all the monitoring forms in the tablet, and that the, the graduation community facilitators would just bring the tablets in order to gather data from the beneficiaries. So we have household live uh, household welfare monitoring forms, livelihood monitoring forms, and it's also allowed real time transmission of data and analysis to gain insight. So uh, it was fast. No? Uh, the, the turnaround from data gathering to analysis was faster because of the online platform. Uh, as an insight, also this would be uh, this type of monitoring we will also be doing in uh, the next in this project with the Department of Social and Welfare and Development with some. Uh, enhancements, uh, modifications onto the platform and onto the programming of the forms. But it really worked. It really helped because we're able to gather data fast and the turnaround time for analysis is also uh, faster. So we're able to decide on certain things no, that we see or certain trends that are happening in the field. Next slide, please. Okay, so after we gathered all the data, no, uh, we've had a lot of uh, we had a long period of time no? because at the end of the pilot, we had to gather all the data, all the, the, the pilot end data, and we come up with uh, different highlights uh, we've, we've, uh, based on the on analysis. analysis uh, on average, 71% of the pilot households met all the contextually graduate, uh, specific graduation criteria and are considered graduated. So we think uh, based on this, no, they are... Um, uh, on the upward trajectory out of poverty. And there, we also see uh, that there's positive behavior change in health, nutrition, and hygiene practices. And uh, participants were also able to launch sustainable livelihoods and generate income even during the COVID-19 pandemic. And participants also in, uh, demonstrated increase in savings and positive behavior in terms of financial management. And a combination of individual livelihoods and group coaching you know, seems to be the optimal configuration of graduation programming for government implement, implementation, as we've seen in the uh, findings based on the analysis of the uh, admin data. Next slide, please. Uh, we have five key challenges. As also mentioned by uh, Asa Cavela, we have participant attrition. There is a lot of people uh, dropping out of the, of, of the pilot. Long delays in asset, in asset delivery. And we were also affected by uh, the Coraisa flu that affected a lot of uh, chicken, uh, uh, free range chicken beneficiaries. Uh, challenges associated with group livelihoods. There were a lot of inactive group members, especially during the COVID, uh, COVID 19 lockdowns. No? So even though we had, um, uh, we had a lot of, uh, um, 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 what do you call this, uh, a lot of success, we also had a lot of challenges. Next slide, please. In terms of um, uh, health and sanitation, there was uh, an increase in consumption of vegetables and fruits, and, treat, and uh, households reported treating water 
uh, before drinking or buying drinking water. So there's an increase in, in uh, uh, health and sanitation practices between the households. Next slide, please. Uh, there's an increased access to toilet facilities and covered latrines for proper sanitation and hygiene practices towards the end of the pilot. Next slide, please. More households demonstrated positive savings and financial management behavior. Though indebtedness rose marginally due to pandemic, uh, we see that over 69% reported having paid back all or part of their loans in the last 30 days. Next slide, please. Uh, um, in terms of groups and individual livelihoods, no, we see that food carts had the highest average income, although retained steady profits no, uh, throughout the uh, although the swine patenting had the ones retained steady profits throughout including quarantine period. Next slide, please. Swine fattening is more individualized as we see, you know, even though uh, they belong in groups, while the food carts would have yielded similarly high income uh, if the COVID-19 pandemic hadn't happened. Next slide, please. Okay, I'll pass on to Dristi for more of the information about the uh, findings and the data. Thank you, Marlo. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I will now share some key findings focused on our research agenda, which was to see the impact of uh, individual versus group livelihoods and individual versus group coaching. Um, so first, we'll focus on the modality of livelihoods. Um, and in this slide, operational livelihood refers to the livelihoods that were provided by the Dole graduation project, um, and we're still running and active. Um, and had not been liquidated, liquidated at the time when the data was collected in September 2020. So based on the data, we learned that more group livelihoods were operational than individual livelihoods, though most households continued um, operating a livelihood on some, in some form. Um, some of the reasons that we realized for this is actually directly related to the advantages of um, having individual livelihoods, such as greater ownership, control, flexibility, and decision-making power, uh, which likely allowed participants with individual livelihoods to liquidate their assets, which um, in group livelihoods, you know, the, the participants shared their responsibilities, shared the assets, shared risks, but it was also challenging for them to gather during the lockdown. Um, so that may be one of the reasons why um, they were unable to liquidate. Um, I'd also like to note here that during COVID-19 crisis, um, due to the response to changing market trends, um, the facilitators actually encouraged households to liquidate their assets and diversify where it was strategic to do so um, in order to maintain productivity during um, the lockdown period. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here, participants who had individual livelihoods, um, here, the green and maroon lines um, had a higher average income per participant. This is likely because those who have individual livelihoods can keep the total income to themselves, whereas in group livelihoods, they have to divide the total income among the group members. Um, we should note that the total income of group livelihoods was lower than what it would have been in normal times because of the challenges that uh, Marlo mentioned. Um, and most of the individual livelihoods were also able to go through multiple business cycles as they received assets sooner, as um, Asik Avila and Mar Marlo also mentioned, um, unlike those in the people who were in group livelihoods. Um, and we can also see, sorry, can we see on that? Thank you. <laughs> I'd also like to point out that the income trend for individual livelihoods is um, somewhat an expected pattern here where you know you see the rise in the first few months um, as they utilize the asset package which included inputs um, and had high incomes and then it was followed by a decline in subsequent business cycles uh, because they had to invest in the inputs and run the business completely on their own um, and then the grayed out part is the quarantine period um, now I'll focus on the coaching modality um, next slide please thank you um, as we see in this graph, the attendance of participants who received individual coaching was higher than those who received group coaching, although the content was the same for all treatment arms. Uh, this is likely because the individual, um, those who got individual coaching, the T3 participants received one-on-one -on -one coaching at their home or uh, place of work, so it was much more convenient for them to attend these sessions compared to those in treatment arm one or two who received um, coaching in group setting and had to come to an agreed upon location. Uh, it's also possible that T3 participants were much more engaged as participants of the project um, and had uh, greater buy-in in the project because they, they did receive their assets earlier. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, here we are looking at uh, the knowledge retention and behavior change from the life skills training. So as you can see in the two graphs, uh, knowledge retention and behavior change were roughly the same across all treatment arms, despite the variation in coaching modality. Um, these are likely due to the life skills training and monitoring techniques that the, the graduation community facilitators applied, uh, which was using visual training aids, hands-on and interactive activities um, that made the training session, sessions much more engaging and interactive. Um, there was also consistent uh, revision and review of the key messages. Um, and because we had also reinforced and supplemented the key lessons um, from family development sessions that Panda with beneficiaries are required to attend, just like Marlo had mentioned earlier. Um, this also shows that group learning can be harnessed and can be effective when we apply appropriate training methods. And we also see that um, looking at both the graphs side by side, uh, we see that the rates closely align by month, which shows that uh, when participants are able to understand and retain information, they're likely to apply the information in practice and change their behavior accordingly. Um, next slide, please. So based on these fi findings, um, as Asik Afila has already mentioned, we concluded that uh, T2, which had individual livelihoods and group coaching, is the optimal cost-effective configuration of graduation for uh, government implementation because it leverages the advantages of individual livelihoods, um, which we mentioned earlier, while also maximizing on the benefits of uh, group coaching. Um, Next slide, please. So to conclude the findings, um, I'll now share about the graduation criteria and the rates um, in this project. And just a quick reminder that, you know, as my colleague Lauren mentioned, uh, graduation criteria is a set of indicators that are locally contextualized um, and measure progress of all the participants along multiple dimensions, such as food security, income, consumption, health, and so on. Um, and these indicators point to households building resilience to shock um, and show that they have been investing in sustainable livelihoods. Um, so in this project, despite all the challenges, um, on average, 71% of the households met each of, them, each of the economic and social milestones indicating their readiness to graduate um, from the project. Um, and we'd also like to point out that due to the COVID-19 crisis, some graduation criteria actually, uh, which was previously determined, had to be adjusted, um, such as school attendance, um, attendance in family development sessions, um, and so on. Uh, so those have not been in incorporated in the graduation rate calculation here. Um, finally, we'd like to end our presentation uh, by sharing some key lessons learned, um, especially around livelihoods and uh, training and coaching. Um, so firstly, as we've mentioned earlier, localized market ass assessment is absolutely critical to find livelihood options, um, especially that um, those that are suitable for households living in extreme poverty. Uh, we also learned that there's a strong preference for familiar homebound livelihoods, um, and especially for individual livelihoods. Um, and in order to address the challenges around asset procurement, um, we highly recommend um, other mechanisms such as assisted cash or a voucher system um, to be used. Um, and around um, you know, strong guidance on livelihood management strategies, diversification are, are key to co-op with shocks like uh, COVID-19 that we experienced um, in this project. Um, similarly, record books um, to keep track of finances should be simple, easy, and accessible to the participants. Um, and finally, building linkages with local resources and local market actors is essential to sustain the impact so that they can continue on um, in the trajectory even beyond the duration of the project. Um, and finally, in terms of coaching and training, um, as you must have seen, coaching is a crucial intervention using engaging practical and hands-on techniques um, and participants in small groups um, training are much more effective than larger um, lecture style trainings. Um, it's also very important to tailor uh, technical training on specific livelihoods um, based on the context, the market assessment and participants skills and knowledge. Um, and finally, you know, digital monitoring data collection um, was very important because it allowed for transmission and analysis of real time data um, and response to urgent needs of the participants and, and tailor the, the response accordingly. Um, and that's how we were able to do um, phone surveys um, and digital monitoring during the COVID-19 lockdown as well. Um, I'll hand it over back to Karen. Sorry, I know we went over time. <laughs> It's okay. You know, it's also interesting. I didn't want to shorten anyone's presentation because I think there's such rich 
lessons to be learned uh, from this work. And, you know, I won't try to summarize uh, with any uh, closing remarks, but I do want to remind everyone that our presentations will be made available online uh, after the fact uh, at socialprotection.org. Uh, and we have a lot of materials online at adb.org as well that provide uh, more information. I've pasted a link in the chat box. Uh, so it remains for me to thank my friends Lauren, Asak Alex, Marlo, and Drishi, uh, and all the colleagues behind the scenes making this happen uh, to make sure things ran as smoothly as possible. So thanks for that. And let me turn over to Yuki now to take us into the next session. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone, for the great session. And um, apologies, but due to the pressing time, we'd like to quickly move on without a break to the next session. I hope it's okay for you. The next session is on pre preliminary evidence from the impact evaluation of graduation in the Philippines. And this session will be again be moderated by um, Yasuyuki Sawada. Once again, he's the Chief Economist and Director General of Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department at ADB. But before handing over the floor to Sawada-san, I'd like to again um, invite you all to share any questions you may have or comments uh, during the upcoming presentations in the chat box. And we'll try um, to select a couple of the questions, if time permitting, and for the presenters to address your um, concerns and questions. So the floor is yours. Sawada-san, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuki. Uh, uh, welcome, everyone, to the session, uh, Preliminary Evidence from Impact Evaluation of Graduation in the Philippines. We will hear more uh, about the uh, impact, rigorous impact evaluation from our uh, IP colleague uh, in this session. Uh, I'm Yasu. I'm Chief Economist and also Head of uh, Research, uh, Director General of uh, Research Department, ERCD. Um, a little bit about the impact evaluation work at ADB. Uh, we have an impact evaluation TA since uh, 2010, and um, uh, ERCD, my uh, department, research department, has been managing a uh, funding tool uh, to cover um, uh, uh, many um, uh, impact evaluation exercises and projects, uh, closely working with the um, uh, operations uh, department. Um, so today, um, uh, Emily, uh, Professor Emily uh, Beam, uh, kindly uh, share uh, with us uh, uh, more uh, details about the impact evaluation of uh, graduation program uh, from the uh, Philippines. And uh, indeed, uh, this um, um, uh, rigorous uh, uh, evaluation uh, uh, study is um, also uh, partly funded by uh, ERCD's uh, ADB's uh, impact evaluation uh, TA. So let me introduce um, uh, Emily uh, uh, briefly. Um, uh, Professor Emily Beam, is a researcher at Innovation for Poverty Action, IPA, uh, and also an assistant professor in Department of Economics at the University of uh, Vermont. And uh, Emily uh, serves as a principal investigator of impact evaluation of the uh, DOLE uh, graduation uh, pilot. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, hand over the microphone to Emily. So Emily, um, uh, I think uh, uh, you can, if you can spend uh, 20 minutes or so for presentation, then we, we can have a, uh, some short uh, discussion. So, Emily, I, uh, I hope you are ready. Thank you so much, Sawada san. Um, yeah, 20 minutes sounds great. So, um, thank you also for the opportunity to be here. I'm, I'm very excited to share with you all um, what we've been learning um, from the impact evaluation side about the effectiveness of the graduation program through the pilot in the Philippines. Um, what I'm gonna be sharing today is evidence from a COVID phone survey that we conducted in August, uh, 2020. And I think um, before I dive into more details, what I wanna highlight is that I think this is a really nice complement to the, the research that um, Dristi and Marlo shared um, whereas they're able to really get very high frequency monitoring data working with respondents um, or with participants, excuse me. Um, what, one advantage of the impact evaluation aspect is that we're able to compare the outcomes, not just before, but also to folks who were not able to be a part of the graduation pilot and specifically folks who were chosen by random selection to receive the pilot versus those who were not selected. And so that's, uh, an approach that enables us to have sort of 
this um, alternate reality almost, what would have happened if it weren't for the graduation pilot. Um, next slide, please. So as has been said, this was a project, um, an important collaboration between Innovations for Poverty Action, BRAC, the Department of Labor and Employment, and then um, ADB, which has been our, our tireless champions throughout. Um, so we've seen that uh, graduation programs have been successful. Um, this is something that um, both Dean and Professor Banerjee um, have talked at the very beginning of our, of our um, conference today. Um, we've seen good effect, strong effects on income on consumption in short term, medium and even long term, and the multifaceted part really seems to be very important. And so the, the questions that this study is really set up to ask um, from a research perspective is, is sort of what is the role of groups, um, specifically group livelihoods. Um, if we get people together, does that help. Um, and then also to increase cost effectiveness through group coaching. Um, next slide please. So the first variation, which um, just to kind of recap uh, what Marlo and Drisby had already described in the previous session, um, is, is the, the introduction of group livelihoods. So most of the existing evidence has focused on individual livelihoods, which have been um, very successful, but also present bureaucratic challenges. Um, just the, the difficulty, the cost, and also the, just the logistics of administering that many livelihoods, especially if we think about scaling up, can become quite taxing to, um, to governments. It's, it's just a hard thing to manage. And so one thought is if people are working together, that might reduce some of those administrative costs and logistical challenges. Um, and it might also create new opportunities. Um, for example, um, as you saw in the, in the video, um, Carabao or Water Buffalo um, owning one raising and then renting out to plow fields is something that's, that can be very high return, but the, the cost of um, a car about as an asset is, is too large for any sort of individual package. Um, on the other hand, there may be challenges in terms of coordination and um, issues with free riding. And so that means that we're not, you know, at the beginning, we're not really sure what would be most effective. Um, in the next slide, uh, we talk about the second variation, uh, which is the group coaching. Um, we, the, the hope is that this will lead to better information sharing, building social ties. Um, and also again, would help reduce the cost of implementation, which could be really important news for other governments looking to initiate or expand their, um, their graduation programs. On the other hand, there's concerns about effectiveness. Um, as we saw before, attendance rates were lower um, with the group coaching and, and that may be related to less personalized attention, less accountability. Next slide. So, I won't say too much about the location. I feel like we've already gotten a really great picture of, of where we're working, where individuals are from. Um, the one thing that I wanna highlight um, is that everyone who we're working with in this study is a recipient of the four Ps, regardless of whether or not they're offered the graduation program. That's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, and they're also four Ps recipients, those who received the cash transfer program, um, who are relatively new to the program. So although the four Ps has been implemented for many years, it's only folks who had just recently been added to the cash transfer program. And next slide. So Marlo described this in a little bit in actually quite a bit of detail, um, but just to recap, we would have three groups here that were receiving different versions of the graduation program. So the first treatment group, this is group livelihoods, having people work together on their livelihoods along with group coaching, meeting in groups of 20. The second treatment is individual livelihoods with the group coaching. And then the third is the individual livelihoods and the individual coaching. And Brock worked very hard to kind of to keep the, the value of the assets per individual relatively consistent across and the frequency of the coaching to be the same. And then to come back on this, the, the control group who were not offered um, the opportunity to participate in the program, they still received the four Ps. They still were receiving the benefits associated with being a part of that program and the regular cash transfers. So really what we're measuring here is the impact of this one-time asset transfer, the coaching, which are really the big things, and then the additional aspects of graduation, right? Thinking about skills training, safe savings facilitation, and community mobilization. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of timeline, from 2018 to 2020, um, 
we first conducted our baseline to understand who our sample was um, and pilot activities began in September. Um, one thing that we had to keep in mind, um, coming back to Lauren's point about the challenges with targeting, is that some folks who we had anticipated would be eligible were actually no longer eligible because they were taking advantage of, they were able to be enrolled in other livelihood programs. And so that required some adjustments. Um, monitoring activities continued through 2019 and the rollout, um, and which is when coaching and asset deliveries took place. And then we saw national quarantine um, with the global pandemic in March 2020. Um, our phone survey comes in in August, and that lines up with the end of pilot activities. Next slide, please. So one way to think about the, the challenges of attrition, um, which Asak Avila mentioned, and also the issue, the, the kind of challenges in getting livelihood delivery out um, is here what we've, what we've done is we've taken some of the administrative data from Brock and looked at sort of how that those assets played out. And what we could see is, that the asset deliveries started much earlier for the individual livelihoods, T2 and T3, and then group was delayed. And this is because of a lot of those administrative challenges that getting a big program like this um, can, take, can take some coordination to make things happen. And so on the one hand, every like things got out, they got delivered, but it did take a little bit of time to work out some of those challenges. Um, and as a result, we did see some reduction in beneficiaries. People who initially signed up for the program um, ended up not sticking with it, um, particularly for that delayed group, um, which uh, is, is one of the challenges. Um, on the other hand, it does encourage us that we're, we're able to see uh, positive impacts despite these challenges. Uh, next slide, please. So the way that we collected the data here, this is gonna be a little bit different um, than the rapid response surveys. Um, we reached out to those who we had phone contact information from because of COVID restrictions, we weren't able to do any surveying in person. And so this meant we could only focus on about three quarters of our sample. Um, we were able to reach out to 63% of those targeted. Um, this isn't close to, this isn't what we had hoped in terms of if we were able to reach out to people in person, um, but it is good enough that it gives us a sense of how folks are doing. Um, and what's important is that we didn't see any relationships between whether we were able to get a hold of people and whether they were assigned, whether they received graduation and people's characteristics did not actually predict whether or not we were able to reach out to them. So we, we feel pretty confident that we have a, a fairly representative sample of the people who participated um, in, the, in our initial baseline study, but certainly we hope for an endline survey to be able to reach a far higher share of folks. Um, next slide, people. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of results, um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so this confirms what we shared, in, shared earlier that in terms of program participation, um, so this applies to the three groups, the group livelihood, individual livelihoods with the group and individual coaching. Um, we see that about 62% of people who received the group livelihood reported they received the livelihood um, because of that attrition. Um, the numbers are higher for individual livelihood um, recipients. At the time that we surveyed people in August, we have about 40 to 60% report that it is currently one of their top three main income sources and slightly less than half were working on their livelihood in the past seven days. Um, again, this is consistent with some, in some people liquidating their assets, but other people continuing to work on them. Um, next slide, please. So what I'm gonna, I wanna kind of show the way that these are presented so then we can keep, um, keep things moving as I talk through the various results. So I'm gonna present mostly graphs here. The gray um, bar is the, the average for the control group, those who are not invited to receive graduation. And then the, the colored bars, um, the blue is that first group livelihood group coaching. And what we'll see consistently is that the, the impacts are a little bit a little bit less, um, but it's still in many cases quite close to the other groups, the individual livelihood with group coaching, which is orange, and the individual livelihood with individual coaching, which is yellow. And so we can compare the gray bars to the colored bars and we can look at the differences. And so what we see, for example, here is we see very large differences in the share of households that um, were had a graduation livelihood as one of their main income sources, but we don't see a big increase in it as their main income source. So this highlights that the graduation program, the livelihood provided is acting as essentially 
that income diversification. It's adding to their portfolio of livelihoods, but for most, it's not serving as a replacement. Um, we're also seeing that work hours haven't really changed um, overall. Um, and this is hours pooled across all different types of livelihood activities or wage work. Um, next slide, please. We also looked at whether or not people had income from their own business, from employment, um, whether they received any assistance. Um, this is almost universally high at 1%, uh, sorry, at 100%. And this reflects that um, everyone, when, we, when they started the program, was a recipient of the cash transfer program. Um, what we see is that those who were receiving um, graduation were more likely to report that they were um, receiving income from their own business and that they were receiving income from agriculture. And reassuringly, we don't see people being less likely to report employment income. So it's not that they're shifting away from wage work and into livelihoods, it's that they're adding new income sources. And um, next slide. So as, as we know, right, the survey comes at, a time, at the time of the COVID pandemic, right? And so people were by and large coping with massive impacts of income loss. And so we asked about different methods of coping strategies to see how individuals were responding. And what we see um, is that compared to uh, the, the gray bars, households who received graduation were less likely to report that they reduced food consumption, less likely to skip or delay healthcare visits, which could be income, but could also be some of the results of the, of the various coaching and mentoring and also community connections. Um, they were, less likely to put, purchase cheaper food. Um, and they were also, if we go to the other side, they were more likely um, to say that it would be okay. It would, it would be either not difficult or somewhat difficult as opposed to extremely difficult and impossible to be able to raise um, 5,000 pesos um, in order to pay for an emergency within 30 days. Um, next slide, please. In terms of food security here, we also see that individuals receiving graduation report consistently better food security. So in these graphs, everything going up is better. So we, um, we don't really see differences in terms of rice consumption, um, but we do see modest increases in meat consumption over the past seven days, less likely to limit portion size, less likely to reduce number of meals, um, less likely to reduce kinds of food eaten. In terms of the numbers here, these are the numbers of days out of the past seven, they did not have to do these. So this means that for the control group out of five of the last seven days, they did not limit portion sizes, which means that they did on average about two, whereas it's 5.5 to 5.7 for those who received graduation. Um, next slide, please. We also wanted to look at um, how households are making decisions after graduation, and particularly with an eye towards women's empowerment. Um, are women able to make more decisions or fewer decisions um, relative to the quarantine, relative to before the quarantine, and does graduation affect that? We also looked at household conflict and also whether women reported experiencing intimate partner violence at the hands of their partner. And so what we see here, um, it, it, the measurements are noisy. You can see that from the, the standard error bars. But what we see is that um, households report, uh, women report that they're, they're less likely to report that they can make fewer decisions. Um, so consistent with uh, more decision-making power. Um, they are less likely to report that they're arguing with their partner sometimes or often. And those who receive graduation are less likely to report that they experience intimate partner violence, suggesting that during COVID, graduation is providing a protective role on these dimensions as well. Um, next slide, please. We also asked um, four different questions about mental health, specifically um, using the patient health questionnaire floor. So it's basically a way of trying to gauge two questions about um, experiences of depression and two questions about anxiety um, with an eye towards keeping the questions short and therefore implementable. Um, in this case, again, high numbers um, on, the, on the graphs are, are better. So what we're looking for here is that we want, if people are not feeling nervous, not able to control or stop worrying, not able um, not having little interest and not feeling down, we see that those values are higher across the board for people who received graduation. So we're seeing better mental health across both anxiety and depression dimensions using these self-reported measures. Um, next slide, please. Um, 
I wanted to share just kind of a, a final slide. This isn't necessarily specific to the impact evaluation, but one thing that came up from our conversations with Brock and with ADB were sort of thinking about how households were faring in terms of various health behaviors. And so one thing we wanted to highlight was um, at the time of August, we didn't see a lot of people staying at home, um, which is consistent with um, lesser restrictions by this point. Um, we saw very high rates of access to soap and clean water, people washing their hands more. Um, and we also see very high rates of people wearing mouth, mouth and nose coverings. Um, and But then at the same time, also experiencing a large share, saying some share that about half saying that they had received some increase in healthcare costs. Um, we see high rates of health insurance coverage, and this is part of household participation in um, the four Ps, which provides some of that support. Um, next slide. So to conclude, um, despite these challenges, which um, Dristi and Marlo were able to explain um, in, in great detail, we, we still see positive impacts across multiple measures. Um, you know, in, in some ways we came into this COVID survey um, worried, right? We see a massive shock that's hurt families in many ways. Um, you know, it wasn't clear to us, would graduation be enough to offer that protection? Um, and we see promising evidence indicating that it does on several dimensions. Um, we also don't see evidence that this lower cost group coaching is reducing effectiveness. Though I do wanna note that this is somewhat preliminary because we aren't able to reach our full sample. Um, that's one reason why we're really looking forward to our endline survey, which is scheduled for May, 2021. Um, we're working very hard to be able to do this in person um, in part because it's important to be able to reach all respondents, including those who we don't have updated phone information for or, or who may not have regular access to a phone and cell coverage. Um, and also so we can ask more detailed questions about household well-being um, in the months since we last talked to households. So I'll stop here and I look forward to our, our questions and our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, uh, for a really wonderful uh, presentation. I think this is very important. Uh, we now see different modalities of uh, implementa implementation of graduation approach. Uh, we can rigorously test and compare, uh, especially group livelihood, group coaching arm. I think this is very important uh, to, when uh, government tried to scale up this program. And also against the COVID-19, um, you know, these results seems to be a very, very encouraging. Uh, Dole pilot uh, seems to be very, very encouraging. So I think uh, uh, this is also very, very important uh, responding to uh, uh, urgent uh, policy uh, uh, request. And um, uh, personally, I was intrigued by uh, result on uh, income diversification and also uh, uh, some positive impact on mental health uh, condition. I, I thought these are very, very uh, important and critical uh, during the uh, COVID-19. Um, uh, you know, Filipino facing, Filipino, Filipina facing longest lockdown uh, around the globe. So I think uh, these are very, very important. Um, so I think um, uh, uh, we have uh, maybe uh, three minutes or so. Uh, uh, I, I think there are many uh, questions already answered online, but I, I'd like to uh, bring up uh, two uh, questions, a broader question. Um, number one is, um, um, so, so it seems uh, COVID-19, against COVID-19 graduation uh, program seems to be really uh, effective. And uh, can you uh, once again uh, recap uh, how, uh, uh, how we can under understand the uh, different pieces of uh, uh, preliminary evidence you provided with us? How can we understand uh, the role of gra graduation program in building uh, uh, families and individuals resilience? So how can we digest? Can you uh, once again uh, summarize or uh, elaborate on your uh, uh, tentative findings? Um, sure, so I'm happy to. Um, so in terms of, you know, how, as we had discussed earlier, right, graduation in some ways is not that rapid response cash assistance, right? But at the same time, individuals in this program had been receiving graduation since 2019 and had been a part of the program, um, actually some since early, late 2018. And so there were a few dimensions where we'll be able to explore more in the end line, but where preliminary signs are, are suggestive. Um, one is that we do see um, the evidence from the administrative data of households um, liquidating assets, selling off assets, essentially 
Um, I remember when we actually served, we were talking with individuals um, and, and visiting with them in person back when we could do that. Um, you know, they, they kind of, they talked about swine rearing, for example, as a piggy bank, right? That you could, it was a pig and that you could save. Um, and so in a way, the asset itself is a savings yeah, vehicle for right. these types of emergencies. And so while many did hold on to their assets and that might provide an avenue for recovery of incomes as things open back up, um, that asset in itself may have been an important factor in providing some security because it is this it has value and it can be liquidated um, in a relatively um, relatively low cost way at a time of, of major crisis like this. Um, I think the, the second factor, which we aren't able to speak to in the detail that I would, I would like to be able to speak extremely surely and confidently, um, but certainly in terms of um, having stronger social networks, um, I think that that would be consistent with what we're seeing. Um, but again, we can't, with this particular study, we can't say that that is exactly what's happening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, another question, uh, which was on uh, in um, uh, Q&A books uh, before, was about the uh, cost. Uh, what's the uh, uh, cost associated with the graduation program? And um, uh, this uh, today's um, uh, presentation, uh, uh, and the study presented by uh, Emily, is really focusing on, um, you know, uh, identifying a cost-effective way, and um, uh, so my question or uh, the question from the floor uh, probably be uh, so with this uh, preliminary result and uh, seeing that uh, uh, group uh, coaching is seems to be as good as uh, individual coaching, uh, can you um, uh, discuss uh, overall uh, cost effectiveness of a uh, 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 new modality of graduation program? So. I'm actually, I'm gonna be a little bit um, vague in my response here, um, only because I don't want us to under or overstate the impacts when we think about cost effectiveness, right? So when we look to the, the set of um, seven studies that were aggregated in, in, in one paper where similar outcomes were compared and costs were looked at, um, the cost varied quite a lot in terms of implementation, mm -hmm. um, but the benefits were standardized. And so we could say, you know, if you spend X thousands of dollars or X hundreds of dollars per person, what type of outcome would you get? And in this case, what we're looking at is we're looking at um, how individuals are doing in August 2020, which is in some ways an important time because COVID mm. has, you know, is, is an ongoing pandemic at that moment. But in terms of thinking about the cost effectiveness, that's not the moment at which we want graduation to be cost effective, right? We want to know what outcomes are in the, at least in the medium run, once people are able to actually operate their livelihoods and act in that capacity. So I think for, for us to be able to speak to cost effectiveness, right? We have this encouraging news that we're not seeing a mm -hmm. lesser effect so far of, um, of group coaching, which is much cheaper, but in terms of being able to quantify the, the cost benefits, there we really would need to see sort of, we'd be able to want to measure those effects once the economy is more open once people are able to actually benefit um, from graduation in sort of the way the program was designed. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Emily. Probably a final question uh, we can take from the floor uh, is in a Q and A box. Uh, so this um, question is about uh, those who couldn't graduate, failed to graduate. Um, um, that indicates that there seems to be a poverty trap, which cannot be uh, really 100% perfectly eliminated by graduation program. So the question is why this happened, uh, why a person or family cannot graduate, and uh, also what can be done uh, for these uh, 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 failure uh, of graduation cases. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, of course, uh, this beyond scope of uh, um, yeah. uh, this rigorous impact evaluation, but do you, do you have any thoughts on this uh, broader issue? So I, I guess the one, the one perspective I would I would bring to this discussion is that what we kind of as the researchers coming in and, and kind of looking and trying to measure trying to measure these you know ultimately the costs and benefits of everything um, we are we're really excited when we see these big increases in people's food security and increases in income and, and evidence of household resilience. That, that makes us happy. We want to do things that reduce 
poverty. Um, at the same time, what we're looking at right now is we're just looking at averages, right? So we're comparing yeah, sort of how is your right. average person. And so just as there are folks who are, you know, able to take graduation and really soar with it, it means that at the same time, there may be other individuals who aren't able to benefit from that. And so what this highlights for us is that graduation itself isn't going to be that silver bullet that solves all the problems. And I think that would also be a lot to ask of just one program. Um, one thing that is good about the, the Philippine context is that even in the, you know, setting aside graduation, the four P's has been there to provide that, that cushion of support. So at least there's, there's something there, but I think one avenue for additional research is to, within our own data, look at those who aren't doing as well and trying to predict yeah. what what's going on there can we look into that more um because that might suggest more avenues to think about additional programs that could target um but at, at the same time i don't think if graduation is not able to lift everyone out in one go i don't think that necessarily detracts from it it's just that it is one component of you know sort of a it's a multifaceted poverty effort. And just as graduation has many components, it's also not the only initiative that governments pursue um, successfully. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Ms. I uh, fully agree. Um, um, with your data, uh, even you can uh, deep dig uh, heterogeneous uh, uh, treatment effect and also um, uh, multifaceted uh, dimension. Um, um, even with your data, you can uh, further uh, uh, study. So I think uh, this is very rich data, uh, rich um, uh, impact evaluation. And uh, also machine, machine learning approach people are now, nowadays trying to use to address uh, heterogeneous uh, treatment effects. So probably there are many things uh, we can learn from your study. And uh, again, we are looking uh, very much for the endline survey by your team and IPA and um, uh, 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 more results upcoming this year. Um, uh, and I, I believe uh, with this, uh, we can better understand uh, uh, about um, uh, different modality of uh, graduation program. With that, thank you. Thank you very much, Emily, again, uh, for your wonderful pr presentation and uh, also wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for so, having Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So I think with that, uh, we'd like to close uh, this uh, presentation session by uh, uh, Professor Emily uh, Bean. So thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, again. So over to you, uh, Yuki. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sawada-san and Emily, for this wonderful impact evaluation session. So with this, uh, we'll be moving to the closing session for the day. And so let me first introduce you to Bruno Carrasco, the Director General of Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department of ADB for his closing remarks. And Bruno, so over to you to conclude today's webinars, please. Okay, uh, good, I guess, afternoon to everyone. Um, uh, it's been a great to see strong participation uh, over the course of uh, this morning's events. So let me begin by thanking all of you for participating in today's event. As our Vice, Pres Vice President for Knowledge Management, uh, Bambang Susantono said earlier today, we believe that uh, the graduation programs offer governments a promising solution to promote long-term positive change and build resilience among the poor. Today, six sessions and 12 speakers focused on understanding the components, challenges, and opportunities in designing and implementing graduation programs. We are delighted that our keynote speaker, Nobel laureate, Dr. Abhijit Banerjee, could join us today one takeaway from his remarks is that this is a particularly opportune moment for a discussion on the graduation approach to be happening as countries around the world are reconsidering and redesigning their welfare and social protection policies. Given the severe impact of COVID-19, we need more than ever innovative approaches uh, to strengthen social protection systems. The key takeaway and what makes this work all the more exciting is that there is indeed strong and consistent evidence in favor of graduation programs as an effective solution to extreme poverty. Based on results from a 10 year study in India and Bangladesh, Dr. Banerjee explained how the positive effects in the long term 
are due to a diverse set of opportunities created in the program, starting with household income generated from assets, followed by diversification and expansion of business. To provide the first leg up the ladder is crucial, and that can take targeted groups to new heights. We also learned about the crucial role that psychosocial support plays in the program, influencing participants' ability to grow. Dr. Banerjee and his colleagues' work inspired a first ADB graduation pilot in the Philippines, and we are now supporting four new graduation programs across three countries. These examples are teaching us how the graduation approach can build on existing social welfare programs with the addition of several components to make social transfers deliver a greater impact. Interministerial collaboration is a powerful enabler for this. The pilot with the Philippines Department of Labor and Employment demonstrated the importance of fostering such collaboration, as well as engaging the local governments through robust impact evaluation data from Innovations for Poverty Action, we learned today how the Philippines pilot contributed to promoting household resilience in the context of the COVID-19 shock. Dr. Banerjee gave us some food for thought, suggesting that we should also think about the design of social insurance in combination with the graduation interventions to increase resilience even further. This is an area that I'm very excited about. Given the resource constraints in our developing member countries, we should continue to invest in data and rigorous evidence, and I'd like to underline rigorous, to understand what works, what doesn't, for whom, and why. We can also learn when to adapt and scale up poverty reduction programs, such as the graduation approach. ADB will continue to support innovation and generate knowledge as we strive to meet the Strategy 2030 operational priority of addressing remaining poverty and reducing inequalities. So to wrap up, I would like to thank all of you for your participation, the speakers for sharing their knowledge and experience, our partners BRAC and socialprotection.org for their support, and the ADB Graduation Working Group and Event Secretariat for organizing today's event. Thank you so much.